Hello everyone, Neil Patel here. Thank you for downloading the best of the Indian Startup Show, episode 100. So today you will hear from Deepak Savrestan, he's the co-founder of Crofters. He talks about tackling the water crisis in India with IoT-based farming. We hear from Manzi Zavari, she's the founder of Kidstop Press, on creating India's most trusted award-winning parenting website. Next up is Jodeep Sen Sharma, he's the co-founder and CTO of Krubel, and he talks about big data and why it matters. We also hear from Shira Shankar, he's the co-founder of Crayon Data on simplifying the world's choices. And finally, we hear from Sadeep Desanal, she's the co-founder of Blueberry Tales on India's booming travel industry. So sit back and enjoy some of the best bits. Hello Deepak, uh, thanks for coming on the show today, much appreciated. Thanks a lot Neil for having me on the show. Brilliant. Um, can you tell our listeners what you're building please? Sounds interesting. So like uh, a couple of years ago, my friends were working on home automation. Yeah. So like, uh, like I was very worried about the state of food and agriculture in our country. Mm-hmm. So like we bumped upon the technology called aquaponics mm-hmm. where you, uh, you combine hydroponics with aquaculture. Mm-hmm. So like we combined all these three together. Then like uh, we came up with the product, what we call now as Crofters ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So which will help you grow your own food in the comforts of your home. You feed the fish, the fish creates waste in the form of ammonia, which is converted by nitrogen cycle into nitrates that in turn help you to grow fresh food right in the comfort of your home without much effort. Mm -hmm. So uh, it took us like more than eight months to develop the prototype. Uh, We went uh, all across India to meet a lot of people working in agriculture, the problems they face. So like all those problems we wanted to overcome through our like prototype. So there is in India, we face huge water crisis. For example, like uh, in many states, we don't have water for agriculture at all because like uh, the main preference is given given to drinking purpose. Then only they give water for agriculture. That was a problem. And globally, a lot of food is wasted by transportation and distribution. Mm-hmm. So uh, we thought that like we need to bring in technology into urban agriculture. So what my friends were doing in IoT, I wanted to apply into I along with my co-founder Ashish. So he's the guy behind the aquaponics and the entire product thing. So mm-hmm. along with him, we built this product. So it was a long journey. We went to a lot of places in India like Kerala, mm-hmm. Karnataka, uh, farms there in Tamil Nadu and all to see the place, mm-hmm. actually uh, get to know the ground reality in agriculture. Then we have applied all the learnings into building this product. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you've been doing it for eight, eight months now. Uh, how's it going so far then? Uh, yeah, uh, like we came up with the initial design some uh, way back in April 2015. Uh, initial design of the product. We showed it to a couple of our friends and they were like immediately ready to buy the product even before like we made one actually. Mm-hmm. So we sold our first product even before making it. Mm-hmm. So then like we thought like uh, what are the applications for this product so like uh, uh, i was working in the social sector before i started this thing mm-hmm. so i thought like why don't we use this for education so a friend of mine was working in a organization called teach for india mm-hmm. you even have this all over the world teach for all mm-hmm. so in india it's called teach for india mm-hmm. so like uh, we uh, partnered with them and like raised some money through crowdfunding and like have used this product for education like uh, teaching kids agriculture right in uh, inside their classrooms. Mm-hmm. So like uh, that was the next uh, thing we did. And like all this helped us in like gaining some word of mouth. And uh, we uh, a lot of people are interested in the product. And like uh, now we are coming up with a series of product which can help you grow uh, the food in your terraces, in your balcony and other stuff mm-hmm. without much effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything like uh, we have applied IoT concepts on mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's this for then? Is it for five families or is it for students or professionals who live in town centers and stuff like that? Uh, mainly this is an urban agriculture movement. So like uh, the product uh, is designed for the urban people uh, who don't have the time and like uh, who can't put in that much efforts to grow their own food. So this is an urban product, uh, like it is applicable for offices, homes, schools, and like uh, people who, who want to do this stuff in their uh, terraces and balconies. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about IoT then. Uh, for those listeners who don't know what it is, in simple terms, you know, what is IoT? IoT, Internet of Things, where uh, like uh, you connect uh, like hardware and software together so they work uh, in sync, like uh, uh, 
uh, in our product like uh, we have tried to recreate the sunlight we have automatic sunrise and sunset so plants need light for them to grow so like we have created uh, replicated the sunlight so through our mobile app you will be able to set the sunrise and sunset time for your ecosystem mm-hmm. so in your living room automatically at 6 o'clock in the morning the system will switch on and uh, when the sun sets down at 6 pm the system will switch off so uh, all this is done through iot syncing of your hardware with software mm-hmm. so uh, for a uh, uh the uh, general people i think this would uh, explain them what iot can do mm-hmm. okay obviously the iot industry is quite big uh what is the state of the iot industry in india at the moment uh, in india just picking up right now like uh, we have a lot of people working on home automation mm-hmm. so like uh, that gave us a boost like uh, when a lot of people are working on it like i we as a team me and my co-founder ashish like we were looking on ways where we can apply it so agriculture is oldest industry in the world so like we wanted to apply iot in agriculture now iot is being applied in all aspects of human life throughout the world but in india still we are catching up mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what excites you most about uh, what you're doing at the moment so like we are enabling people to grow their own food so uh, the problem is uh, right now people are consuming industrialized food you don't know how your food is grown for uh, them we are like uh, enabling them empowering the people to grow their own food so this idea actually excites me empowering people to grow their own food mm-hmm. you mentioned food uh, what type, what type of food would you say uh, leafy greens herbs uh, fruits like uh, strawberries st- and uh, like uh, uh, exotic plants like lettuces and other stuff lettuce is the one of the most uh, 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 like uh, the plant which you can have a good amount of harvest in your ecosystem lettuce is the plant which is widely popular in aquaponics so lettuce will be the best thing to grow in this ecosystem mm-hmm. how long will it take then to sort of grow grow lettuce and stuff so, like that so uh, like 45 days so in traditionally it takes 60 uh, 60 to 70 days but in our ecosystem it takes around 45 days mm-hmm. but uh, like you can also consume them at the microgreen state also like you can make salads you can have daily harvest of wheat grass like for example two of our users mm. they are like uh, uh, senior citizens they go for a jog mm. every day in the morning so 6:30 in the morning uh, after a jog they come back uh, spend some time with the ecosystem harvest wheat grass and like consume it uh, it's a source of protein for them mm-hmm. mm, nice. uh, in terms of like a maintenance then uh, does the system need lots of maintenance or do you just like switch on and just let it go uh the main uh, the only kind of maintenance will be like you need to harvest the crop regularly mm-hmm. okay so that will be the maintenance and you need to refill your water tank because there will be some amount of water loss due to evaporation and the plants will be observing them apart from that there wouldn't be any maintenance at all so we are uh, like working towards a zero maintenance product mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but how, and do you, obviously do you need like a i think you mentioned an iphone app or a, a google play app Is that correct? Yeah, uh right now in India like Android is the most used yeah. uh, operating system so we are present on Android. iOS will be launching it soon. Mm-hmm. How, can you share some stats then? I mean, uh, how, how many have you sold? Uh, I mean, is it still in uh, early adoption mode or are Yeah, uh, we are still in early adoption okay. mode. We haven't uh, like gone to the mass production still in early adoption mode. We are like 15 early adopters for our Windows system mm-hmm. in the past 3 months. We opened it in uh, like uh, last year September. So in 3 uh, months we were able to like uh, get 15 early adopters mm-hmm. in Chennai alone. Mm-hmm. Right uh, right now we are like going to Bangalore. to expand our early adopter program so like we are looking at uh, 50 early adopters in the next one month so uh, we want to like uh, test it with our early adopters first mm-hmm. before we go on a mass scale mm-hmm. so that we gain their feedback and better the ecosystem mm-hmm. excellent so we want to take it slow yeah. basically uh, and what kind of feedback have you had from the early adopters so the one main feedback is it has eased their gardening efforts so earlier they used to spend like 30 40 minutes watering all the plants tending to them and like uh, taking care of them right now it's inside their living room they spend uh, maybe like 5 minutes a day uh, staring at them but it's a good uh, piece of conversation piece for them like they spend the entire evening with the family mm. around the ecosystem tending to the plants looking at the fish it sends a positive vibe 
to the entire family and in offices we have people who spend their entire lunch time around this ecosystem mm. like playing with it discussing about the ecosystem and like uh, since uh, we have this in IT company like uh, they are thinking about like how to uh, add artificial intelligence and machine learning to the ecosystem so so uh, we could expand this to a larger skill mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh, how do so you this- how do you go about finding early adopters because obviously we have listeners who may be building a startup um, they may need help in getting early adopters any any advice and help the thing is like uh, the product must be unique mm-hmm. it must be attractive and like uh, pitch it to the right people it took us time actually like uh, uh we took some time in like building a good product before we actually opened it up for the earlier of the thing so build a good product then pitch it to people like make use of social media like all our early adopters we got it either through twitter or facebook so we wrote a lot of blog posts about our product the kind of work we are doing so that's one thing and like actually meeting people a lot of networking events where i spoke about i pitched my product in local startup events those people were interested and uh, they asked me about the, uh, if they could be part of the earlier adopter program so in 3 months we were a- able to reach uh, 15 people in chennai mm-hmm. so if you are in a larger city mm-hmm. you could obviously reach more people mm-hmm. cool and when will this go live in production then So the uh, production plan right now we are like uh, locking up uh, the final tech specs mm-hmm. so we are expecting to go on production in early march or end of march uh before that we are making few more prototypes which we are testing mm-hmm. so uh things must uh, get going by march mm-hmm. hopefully hopefully yeah definitely um, yeah. Uh, um how big do you want to go with this then so uh, right now we are focusing on uh indoor ecosystems mm-hmm. but uh, we also are like working on like large scale commercial automated farms mm-hmm. where uh, like uh, where 10 people you previously used to work there only one person with a mobile app needs to be there so we are like piloting it uh, in a place near bangalore mm-hmm. so the climatic condition is good there so like we are piloting a large scale a uh, farm so hopefully in the next one and a half to two years we'll be having like commercial urban farms mm-hmm. automated farms in major cities mm-hmm. excellent and how how much does it cost to buy, to buy one of these things so the indoor ecosystem uh if you uh, take it in dollars it, uh, in india you can buy this ecosystem for 300 mm-hmm. dollars so the pricing is like 300 dollars in india mm-hmm. it's uh, uh for uh, we are yet to open up the orders for like uh, internationally so we are working on the pricing for like uh, considering all the logistics we are working on it to ship the product gro- globally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let's let's talk about you then uh, what's your background yeah. oh, please so like i did my engineering mm-hmm. uh, along with my co-founder from nit trichy Uh, it's uh, say, uh, it's one of our premier colleges like the iits mm-hmm. so way back in a uh, college like i met my co-founder and uh, uh, so we used to discuss a lot about startups then we took two different ways like i worked in the banking sector mm-hmm. after my college he used to work in the manufacturing sector uh, so like we used to meet often and like discuss about startups and uh, other stuff so like when we had uh, like common friends working on iot mm-hmm. so we thought why don't we like uh, take this idea further to something which is more a uh, fundamental problem mm-hmm. so uh, he was into aquarium and aquaponics mm-hmm. that guy so like uh, slowly we started getting the idea of this product and like we started prototyping this is how we formed the team and like started working on this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay cool uh, is this your first startup uh no actually like uh, i had previously worked on a movies oh, recommendation nice. engine uh way back in my college so we worked for like one and a half to two years on it uh prototyping but uh things didn't fall in place so we had to shut it down mm-hmm. but we had good response for the blog part of it we couldn't launch our mvp mm-hmm. so there were like development difficulties and other stuff uh financials and other stuff so uh, we had to move on right when things don't work you need to move on so this is my actually my second startup Mm-hmm. What, what would you say you've learned from your first startup? So, uh, like the for for the first startup, I was very passionate. Mm. So, like uh, 
uh, i was not ready to give up the idea when uh, like other people felt that this is not working so it took me some time for me to realize that things are not working so uh, now i am in a position that i am more practical so passion like passion is good but also you need to be practical so my first startup taught me this lesson Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what's your management style? And uh, do you have a management style? Obviously, you've only been doing it for eight months. Are you still learning? Yeah, still like, learning. <laughs> uh, yeah, like management style is. Uh, I was inspired by other people in the sense that it's like when we are working in a team, like uh, we must. Uh, like, uh, w- uh, if you want to be a good leader, like you must uh, lead the way. Like instead of commanding other people, pe- become part of the team and like uh, do it and like show the people how it must be done. so this what i've learned from the people with whom i worked in college and in other organizations mm-hmm. and what what's it like being a startup founder is it fun uh, is it serious it has been fun like uh, uh, initially during the prototyping stages like we faced a number of problems and the way we overcame with uh, all the manufacturing hurdles it's mm-hmm. one hell of a thing so it was like obviously fun developing product and like getting feedback from people you get a lot of weird feedbacks and like weird ideas so mm. it has been a fun and even full journey so far i mean what is the hardest part about building this this startup then is is it the manufacturing would you say or the sales or uh, uh in a country like india like uh, we bad we don't have that much awareness mm. uh it's very difficult to uh show the people what the uh, the things the product can do so like convincing people about the product itself was uh, difficult because uh, uh india is uh, still uh, not a mature market where uh, like we could sell indoor farms so it was very difficult for us to initially uh, make people imagine this kind of a product and like uh, convince them this will actually work mm-hmm. excellent so Okay. that was the biggest problem for us mm-hmm. convincing people and like making them understand the idea the larger vision of it what urban farming on a larger scale can do to the country and to the community mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what is the vision of the company then uh to localize food production create hardware and software that will enable anyone to farm their own fresh food we want to create series of products and uh, uh soft we want to open source uh with technology so that like anyone can use the data mm-hmm. and technology to grow their own food mm-hmm. so for ag- for people to do farming and agriculture we need data and the right know how so that's the barrier we want to break it basically mm-hmm. excellent um say in 12 to 24 months uh, what you know what is the plan where would you like to be so in 12 to 24 months we want to like uh, uh be present throughout india with this product and like after that we want to make ourselves ready for the larger uh, large scale farming so that uh, we could uh, uh, solve one of most pressing problems of agriculture throughout the world mm-hmm. and uh, the larger uh, farming market mm-hmm. excellent L- last few questions then uh, who would you say has yeah. been the biggest influence on your on you so far Elon Musk because like uh, I have read uh, his autobiography and like I have watched mm-hmm. so many numerous videos of him like uh, mm-hmm. uh, like whenever like I face some problem like uh, I read about the kind of problem he has faced in his life so uh, he has been a very influential person in my life mm-hmm. excellent uh, let's let's say you met Elon Musk for a coffee what question would you ask him like uh, i would ask him anything because like i have uh, got uh, uh, like whatever his uh, thoughts through his videos and other stuff so like i uh, try to like tell my idea and like get his feedback maybe like i'll tell him what i'm working on and uh, try to get his feedback basically mm-hmm. excellent uh, what advice would you give first time founders <laughs> like uh, do mistakes and like be quick enough to learn and unlearn we will learn only through our mistakes so like uh, if we are like uh, doing some mistake we must not worry about it rather than like uh, must be uh, like uh, satisfied and content that we actually did something and learned that it's not working mm-hmm. excellent uh, what do your friends and family think of this by the way so like uh, th- they are a bit sc- skeptical actually like mm-hmm. uh, skeptical about how the thing is but uh, the thing is like we need to be det- uh, determined my take is like we need to be stay uh, staying focused uh-huh. about what we are doing and clear so me and my co-founder we both are clear that this 
is going to be something which will impact people in a good way so we are working towards it mm-hmm. how, how do you stay focused then because obviously you're doing speaking to me and then you got to do business meetings etc uh, and then you got to execute uh, how, how do you stay focused <laughs> how the no one particular way the we must always think about the final uh, final uh, goal which we want to achieve so like whenever we feel the press we I, i always think about the final goal which i want to achieve so like we need to keep going and moving on mm-hmm. excellent um have you got any favorite blogs or books you like to recommend uh, i think you mentioned I, Elon Musk before i follow y combinator and okay. uh, y combinator so uh it has been a very integral part of my startup journey all the blogs by uh y combinator and their youtube uh, how to build the future series so that has been very inspiration and uh, i also recommend uh, your podcast because like uh, i found it very interesting similar way there is a, st- a podcast by y combinator startup school mm-hmm. so that was also a very interesting podcast cool is this a bootstrapped startup or is it a funded startup we are a bootstrap startup like uh, we me and my co-founder we were working for like one and a half years before we started up actually mm-hmm. so we have put in our savings mm-hmm. to it and like uh, now we are uh, in like uh, able to generate some revenue so things are pretty good right now at the moment mm-hmm. so as of now we are a bootstrap startup mm-hmm. uh, are you looking for like funding in the near future or would you like to go in like a tech accelerator etc like why like why can why combinator <laughs> like uh, we want to show some traction before we decide upon things so like for the next 6 months we are focused upon like uh, onboarding more people for our early adopter program after that uh, depending upon the feedback and other stuff we want to uh, make our next set of plan mm-hmm. nice. for the next 6 months we are focusing on our early adopter mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. away from this startup and what are your hobbies and interests what, what how do you relax I watch a lot of movies like as I told you my previous startup was about movies so I watch a lot of international movies and I also do write about movies oh nice so so that's one hobby and like uh, I like meeting a lot of people mm-hmm. and discussing uh, their idea so a lot of my friends are also into startups so like weekends and all like we meet and like discuss about their ideas and like how we can take things mm-hmm. can you re- can you recommend any movies to our listeners of the weekend <laughs> <laughs> so like i uh, like i just uh, was rewatching narcos okay. uh, narcos by uh, netflix so it's also a good thing like entrepreneurs can watch so how pablo scales his, scales up his business though we can't do this it's not legal so <laughs> <laughs> but uh, narcos is actually a good watch for all the entrepreneurs out there mm-hmm. excellent in terms of movies movies like uh, Uh, I was watching Arrival I guess last night. Arrival is was a good one mm-hmm. and like all the good movies out there like La La Land mm-hmm. that's also about like how we must follow dreams and other stuff right so like uh, dreams are the one which uh, keeps people go- going on so even La La Land is a good movie if all the entrepreneurs out there can watch. Definitely I'll watch it over the weekend. Hello, Manzi. Uh, thanks for coming on the Indian Startup Show today. Uh, thanks, Neil. Brilliant. Tell me uh, a little bit about what you're building, please. Um, so, Kidstart Press is a digital parenting platform that we're trying to build to simplify parenting because uh, today the, the biggest problems that parents face is paradox of choice, and uh, we believe that parenting is a really simple process. Mm-hmm. But um, because a lot of parents in India. I'm moving towards the nuclear family setup. It's just getting a re- it's getting a bit complicated in terms of um you know being being alone in raising your children and therefore um uh, there's no real platform that unifies all the information that a parent is looking for in the digital space and uh, especially in the Indian context, right? Mm-hmm. So we're trying to do that for Indian parents across the globe because we realize that Indian parents across the globe want to go back to the way um, they were brought up but unfortunately um, there's no Indian context to it a lot of uh, there are a lot of parenting platforms but they all all have um, you know sort of uh, an international character to it while while the Indian landscape culturally physically socially is so different mm-hmm. that the parents needs are also very different um, so very simply put we're a digital platform um, you know trying to simplify parenting for indian parents across the globe mm-hmm. 
Excellent. Uh, what inspired you to do this? Can, can you remember the, the light bulb moment? Right. Um, so uh, it was it was actually, um, you know, I've, I've had a career spanning across 15 years in uh, in digital, in lifestyle, in brand creation. And, um, you know, towards the latter half of my corporate life, I realized that I was, you know, spending and I was a mom by then. And I realized that, you know, as urban Indian working parents, we're spending about 60 to 70 percent uh, in front of a digital device. And that was about 2000, 2011, 12, when India was really going through the digital, um, digital and social boom, I would say. Uh, and social was coming up in a big way. Mm-hmm. And I was like, there has to be a way that a parent sitting on his or her desk can have a more integrated and inclusive approach to parenting versus just leaving your child in the daycare or leaving them with grandparents, not knowing what to do, where to take them, how to spend the weekend, because really we, we, we really have no options because um, today parenting is getting more inclusive and kids and parents want to do and families rather want to do everything together. So how do you figure that out sitting on your desk? And that was the moment when, um, you know, the idea just sparked and I quit my job to start this. Um, so it was always the vision was always there to build a build a platform or build a brand um, that connects and simplifies the life of the parent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what were the early early days like then? Uh, and any uh, any obstacles? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Uh, so early days were like, um, you know, so everybody would, would uh, uh, like I said, India was going through a whole digital social retail boom at that point in time. And given the kind of uh, career opportunities I had in front of me, everybody thought that I was probably insane to be doing this because uh, being an entrepreneur, being a founder at that point in time was not so glamorous that it is today, right? Um, it, it just, um, people thought that, you know, just like, any other girl, I'm probably just quitting my job and, you know, I'm going to be like, um, you know, I'm just building something for a hobby mm-hmm. um, and not really a business. So they thought that, yeah, I mean, it's okay. You know what she's doing? I mean, you know, it's fine. I mean, it, as far as it contributes a little bit of pocket money, I think she should be doing fine. So I think that belief in yourself and the discipline to kind of just be at it every day and mm-hmm. say, hey, I'm going to do this and uh, believe in what I'm doing. Um, is is great, right? And early days were like, all right, there was um, there was me, my phone, and my laptop, mm-hmm. and that was about it. And great internet connection, right? I think that's that's pretty much uh, all that I had. And I remember uh, that first comment or that first invite uh, to a place, or you know, the first time an article would go up or a review would actually go up. Mm-hmm. And that's that's actually uh, one of the big uh, unique points for Kids Stop Press, right? So we're the only parenting platform in India currently that reviews, uh, curates and creates um, things for, you know, um, reviews a place or reviews a product for parents because we understand that parents are spending so much time and and money and energy to go to a place or to buy a new product or to experience um, a service, right? Mm-hmm. And how do you make that, how do you help parents make that informed choice? Um, so that's, that's um, you know, that was, the, that was the whole genesis of the product. And, um, you know, so I'm glad that the minute, I mean, starting out is always like a one-man show and mm-hmm. then obviously building, building the bricks uh, and getting all of, those bl- uh, all of those bricks to kind of believe in your vision. Excellent. Uh, what was the reaction of your friends and family when you said you're going to quit and do Yeah, like startup? I said, right? Like I said, right? They thought I was probably... Uh, so my parents were absolutely, um, absolutely shaken because we come from a family where everybody's, you know, uh, extremely educated, has really settled jobs. And it's, you know, I mean, everybody in the corporate space, my, pro- my parents probably thought that uh, I was crazy, right? Because uh, even though my dad's into business, mm-hmm. um, they said, listen, you know, I mean, we don't understand what you're doing. I mean, they still don't get it. My parents still don't get it. They, uh, you know, like when people come up to them and say, hey, your daughter does this. And my dad would be like, hmm. And my mom would be like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, but really, I mean, she still thinks I'm probably, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just somebody on the internet and uh, she still doesn't know what I'm doing and she doesn't think it's cool enough. So, but, but yeah, that, that one person who really could see my vision through, I think was my husband who said, listen, dude, if you believe in this, you 
you know, you just got to go at it. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, whatever it takes, right. If you have, if you, if you're really passionate about it and, um, I mean, he, we both saw this as a great market mm-hmm. opportunity as well. So, uh, he said, listen, if you believe in this, then just, then just go for it. And I was like, absolutely. Um, and yeah, after that, there's been, um, no looking back. Mm-hmm. So I think when you start out, I think it's, it's people would really think you're crazy, right? I've read so many startup founder stories and, uh, I remember reading this about, uh, you know, Bhavesh Agarwal of Ola and his, he, he's saying somewhere that his parents really thought, ke, you know, my son's going to be a travel agent and dude, how can, how can my son be a travel agent? <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's like, um, you know, he's like a really big startup guy today with Ola cabs. But, but I mean, I think it, it takes a lot for friends and family to uh, believe that, okay, this is going to, you know, this idea is going to mm-hmm. take shape someday and it's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, but it's only, and it's interesting also as a startup founder uh, to see how the ideas and attitudes and reactions of people change Mm -hmm. as those, um, as that building keeps getting closer to completion or keeps getting higher in, uh, you know, towards your vision. Um, So it's interesting to see all of those ideas and all those reactions and, you know, stuff evolve and change as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can you remember the actual moment then you thought, actually, this is, this is going to work, you know, people like the website, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, um, so, you know, we're, we're in the midst of doing, um, our fourth season of, uh, Kids Top Press Awards, which is awarding the best in parenting and baby care. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, when I started out in 20, uh, late, you know, like December, 2011, mm-hmm. and by, uh, about, um, Feb, 2012, we had, um, the Kids Top Press Awards season one. Mm. And, uh, you know, I saw the traffic on the website go mm. crazy, right? Because it's a popular voting uh, platform. Mm. Um, and, you know, parents really need to award the service or the brand that's caused a significant stir in their parenting journey. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that traffic numbers, you know, with very few brands back then, but go through that, um, go through that space, uh, you know, go through that um, curve, right? When I saw the numbers just explode, I was like, dude, there has to be something, um, you know, there has to be something in here because, you know, you're building the category. And in our case, um, literally, because we were one of the first movers in this space, I have seen the space evolve, Mm -hmm. right? So I would say that, um, you know, that reaction to some of the best moments have actually come by in the last maybe one or two years, uh, because you just realized that you were the one of the first guys to be building the category, right? So people didn't even know that, uh, you know, people would buy or consume products or services by, by somebody else's uh, influence or, you know, you could be an influencer in that space and drive so many decisions, right? From which car do you buy to which... Um, you know, which phone you should be getting to what your kids should be eating for breakfast or which school they should be going to mm-hmm. or which after class, after school activities like or, uh, you know, games are really uh, in. So you're, you're pretty much driving all of those decisions. So um, it's interesting to see how the categories actually evolved. And especially for us, because we have seen that through, right, mm-hmm. um, from a category that didn't exist to building that category. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then on obviously seeing um you know, so today on our awards, we get about 60,000 people voting every single season. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, you know, so we've mm-hmm. grown from about 20 categories to 33 categories and about 70 nominees to about 280 nominees today. So it's it's an awesome journey. And of course, uh, every time that you meet a parent, be it at a social event or be it at an event that we're curating, you realize that you are actually making a difference um, to somebody's life, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think when they say that, listen, every time um, you recommend something or it's, um, you know, or something that you suggest or or we swear by what you say, I feel feel like a huge sense of responsibility more than, um, you know, a sense of achievement because... uh, you feel you feel responsible for so many people because at the end of the day you're dealing with children and parents right so you can't be wrong mm-hmm. you you just mm-hmm. you might as well get your stuff in place um, because this, there's no messing around with with this sort of uh, category play right mm-hmm. uh, so so it's very interesting and it's a very fulfilling experience because um, you know it's it's literally like i said it's starting out from scratch so it's interesting Excellent. um you've got a lot of content on the website uh, i mean do you have like yeah. a specific content strategy 
Uh, obviously, we have we have listeners who may need some help with their content on their website. Have you have any tips? Yeah. Uh, so, um, Kids Stop Press caters to parents, uh, actually to fam, uh, actually to couples who are looking at starting out a family. Mm-hmm. So, right, uh, right at conception stage. So that's about minus nine, going all the way up to eight years till your child is about eight or nine years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're looking at helping these set of parents um, make informed choices on every milestone of their child's life. Uh, and it's got to be very cognitively placed because parenting is a, is a journey you've never treaded before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, here I'd like to quote uh, what Charles Duhigg once, uh, you know, in his book Habit said that, um, you know, parents or parents to be are or expectant parents rather are a gold mine for any brand because that's one point in time in the lifetime of consumer mm. that he or she is willing to change every habit that they have because they are actually taking onus of a, a new life, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So be it your toothpaste, be it your shower gel, be it your coffee, be it your tea. You're you're going through that metamorphosis to make every possible thing right Mm -hmm. to give birth to your child right so um so we are and that journey is so um you know, we are with you in that journey. We're literally like your virtual nanny. So you want to figure out which hospital you want to go to, who should be your OBGYN or who should be your pediatrician or what are you going to need as soon as you deliver or where are you going to get it? Uh, how are you going to celebrate your baby's first birthday and, you know, so on and so forth. And and addressing that with a multi-media uh, dispensing channel, right? So be through audio where we have our um, radio station for parents and for kids, which is a digital platform because we listen, we we figured that kids are obviously consuming content which is not age appropriate and how can you address their curiosity mm-hmm. so we have a radio station for both parents and kids um, we have um Obviously, the website where they can get everything uh, by city and by age of uh, child. Mm-hmm. Uh, thirdly, we have our YouTube channel where they can get to know of a lot of DIYs, food ideas, interview and conversations, a lot of interesting people, celebrities and experts. And most recently, where we've launched our subscription program where they get a curated experience and, um, you know, and discount across all the partnering brands that we have. And we have about 50 odd partnering brands today because we really realize that parents keep going back mm-hmm. to the same place again and again because the best of power of the child is so high mm-hmm. uh, and um, you know and your life cycle is as as, uh, as a consumer in that space is also very high so if your child is between six months to 24 months or 36 months chances of you going back to a play area in your vicinity vicinity is so strong mm-hmm. that you know you become a repeat consumer automatically mm-hmm. and this category does not want to try um, so there Therefore, this this uh, subscription program, which is called KSP Code, is what we la- launched last summer and uh, in, in Bombay, and uh, now it's going to roll out in uh, Delhi and Bangalore as well. So, so interesting space because um, you know you're connecting on every milestone and every um, every possible uh, space or touch point that the parent is present in. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, so, looking forward, what is the plan for the next twelve to twenty four months? Uh, I think the the plan for the next 12 to 24 months is, of course, um, you know, to ensure that we're building uh, world class teams. We already have a great team, but uh, trying to get, um, you know, more progress on that. And we're obviously upgra- upgrading our technology to make it more, um, more user friendly. And of course, trying to integrate it more cognitively um, and uh, yeah, and, and tell better stories, right? Because today it's not about, um, it's not about just brand building but it's about engaging and helping brands say their stories uh, and say more compelling stories so I think um, yeah that that will absolutely be the plan and building like I said a 360 degree media company Mm -hmm. and ensuring that we're touching um, you know a parent's life uh, every touch point that a parent is on and at Uh, so that would be interesting and of course um, to continue uh, what we've always stood for which is uh, you know, which is being trusted uh, and uh, curated, right? So that's that's obviously our vision, and that'll um, that's going to stay um, and uh, and in tandem with uh, what what Kids Stop Press believes in, which is simplifying parenting. So the next twelve to twenty four months will, of course, uh, go in rolling that out. Mm-hmm. What's it like being a solo founder then? Because obviously, when I do this podcast, they usually have like co founders, but uh, <laughs> you're a solo founder. How, how are you finding that? 
um i think it's it's interesting and at the same time um it's it's uh, tough okay so i I've, I've uh, you know when i started out a lot of people told me that dude you have to get the uh, you have to get a co-founder it's very lonely to be out there and be all alone but honestly uh, i would have if the right i so it wasn't that i was averse to getting a co-founder mm-hmm. maybe i um didn't really find the right match right so i would have loved to um uh, love to get somebody along the way because i think it eases out a lot um of pressure on the founder mm-hmm. uh, because it's 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 hard i mean entrepreneurship is i think uh, the toughest thing that i've and i keep joking about this to everybody right so i'm a mom of two and i said i can push another baby but uh, i don't think um, entrepreneurship is for everyone right it's the toughest thing that i've really done mm-hmm. uh because your every day is a different ride um so i would say that if you get a co-founder who believes uh in your vision and you know who believes um exactly in the same goals objectives and has uh, the same same sort of passion that you have for your uh, for your uh for your uh, company then that's great but don't uh, don't hold on to an idea because you don't have a co-founder right or you ma- haven't managed to get one yet um so i mean that's that's what i would say i mean it's it's been hard i mean sometimes you you want you know you want to um, like stop breathe but there's no time to do that because you're always on the always on the treadmill and there's just no stop button because you're the sole founder but i think that's okay uh, so if you get somebody along that's great but if you don't then just build a world class team mm-hmm. and uh, in fact now when we're upgrading our tech we're actually getting somebody who um, you know who are going to be more than tech partners i would say they would literally be like our tech co-founders um so so just when the marriage has to happen it will happen so i would say just like i said don't hold on to your uh, hold on to your dream or your idea because you are a soul a soul founder mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so those soul founders who are listening to this podcast um uh, what should they be focusing on what's the one thing they should be focusing on uh well um you know i keep telling uh, this to everybody right so one is obviously that the idea is way bigger than the entrepreneur always keep the idea and the product at the forefront because that's the only thing that's going to drive uh drive everything you have to be you have to have the grit discipline and resilience to keep going back to the drawing board again and again and show up uh every single day because there's just no um because there's just no other way to to be an entrepreneur uh, or maybe there's just no other way i know how to be an entrepreneur um because you know you just have to kind of just uh you know just be out there uh, and and do the job right some and of course the ability to multitask right so you're wearing multiple hats as a founder i would say whether you're founder co-founder any anybody any entrepreneur but you at the end of the day the entrepreneur has to wear multiple hats take responsibility uh, even when the chips are down sometimes you know you just have to get up stand up show up broaden your shoulders and say okay i'm going to steer the steer the ship from here on right uh, inside you might be feeling like hey i can't do this but you have to put on that facade and drive the team because everybody's expectations and um you know everybody's expectations and eyes are on you so i think that's uh, that's very very important the other bit i would say is also um that that you know time is of the essence right uh, you have only 24 hours in a day so just prioritize what you're going to do uh, especially if you're a single founder because you will not be able to do everything uh, so you have to really really prioritize what you're going to outsource what you're going to keep within um, and and prioritize basis that right uh, know your strengths and weaknesses don't be afraid uh, or shy away from admitting or accepting um, uh, you know what you could do better or what you could outsource because like i said you're not going to be able to do everything really um so that would be interesting and uh i would say yeah i mean and 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 of, of course the uh, because nobody will be able to eat breathe sleep live the life that you're going to live i mean if you're if you find a team which i think is extremely important who believes in your vision uh so do that build a team that believes in your vision but remember that um, you know there will be lots of lots of people coming along the way who will kind of steer you away from your vision but just keep your eyes uh, on the target with blinkers on and and yeah i guess uh, that's about it mm-hmm. what would you say you've learned from your journey then so so far 
uh, I think that one, um, the one or two things that really stand out in my journey would be uh, that entrepreneurship is really uh, is really tough. But I would say that I would want it any other way. Um, and the best part is if you can, I mean, in the last four years, I haven't found a single moment when I said, dude, I can't do this anymore. I mean, I've found uh, many more moments where I can say, damn, it's Sunday night. I want Monday morning to begin. I'm raring to go to work, mm -hmm. right? So the, if the Monday morning blues don't really affect you or don't bother you and you're really looking forward to a Monday, I think you're an entrepreneur because you're just so possessed with that idea and so possessed with just doing the best and achieving that excellence in whatever you're, whatever you're passionate about or whatever is the vision of your company. Um, so I think, I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that I've learned. And of course, grit and resilience, right? So you've got to bounce back every single time. I think uh, discipline grit is something um, that I think is incomplete. I mean, entrepreneurship is incomplete without both of these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Can you give us some examples then of, where, of when you had to bounce back? Um, it could be multiple reasons, right? Multiple ways, right? So sometimes, um, you know, when we when you're doing things and so when we're writing an article or we're shooting some product and it doesn't actually turn out to be the way it is, or you're looking at the numbers at the end of the month and it doesn't, it's, it's not, it's not what you planned or what you put on paper, right? Because uh, every startup has those target numbers and sometimes it doesn't have that, but you know, you've got to pull up you know, pull up your team because sometimes they're demotivated and say, hey, we're going to do this, right? Uh, and of course, you're the last man, uh, last one packing up because they can have good days and bad days, but, uh, you know, and sometimes they can get derailed as well. Uh, but you've got to say, hey, you know, I can do it. So my definition of a CEO CDC is you're literally uh, the CEO to what we call in India is the Chaprasi, which is the office boy, right? Because... Uh, You've got to do, you've literally, you're literally the last man standing. So everybody, when everybody's down and out, you got to pick up the chips and say, hey, we're going to get through this. Excellent. Obviously, we have, may have like mums listening to this who may want to start their own business. Uh, right. What advice would you give them? Any tips? Um, yeah, so a lot of people actually ask me this, right? So how do you achieve, you know, the, I, I, I wonder, uh, actually, why is this question always posed to, uh, you know, this whole work-life balance thing um, is always posed to moms as opposed to dads, because I think in today's times, it's extremely challenging for even the dads to have that work-life balance, because parenting today is no longer a woman's job alone, right? Uh, so while I'm actually taking the Skype call, my husband's uh, watching the kids. Uh, so so it's it's interesting, but I would just say that, listen, I mean, um, if you want to start your own business, and I, and, you know, I think this is again about entrepreneurship, that everybody's going to like, everybody's not going to believe in your idea. They don't think it's cool enough. But if you think it's cool enough, then just go out there and start. You know, you may succeed, you may not succeed. Um, but it just really doesn't matter, right? And uh, I think a lot of moms, especially in India, when, you know, we're speaking at, you know, at women conferences or startup conferences, they say that, you know, but I have to do this, but I have to do that. But like I said, discipline and grit. If you go after both of those, then I don't think, um, you know, that you're not going to achieve what you've set out for. And uh, so I would say that, you know, if you were passionate about something, if you really want to do it, you always find time for it. Uh, so, and there is, I mean, it just looks, um, it just looks really glorified out there that, hey, she can do it all. But really, you don't know what's going in her house or you don't know uh, what she's giving up for it. So uh, it's not, I mean, people make it seem easy, but it's really not that easy. Uh, so if you want to just, just go ahead and start your own business, just go ahead and start your business. Because if you're going to think too much and deliberate over it too much and, you know, do a lot of fancy stuff after it and only then say, okay, now, cool, I don't really need to do it, then it's okay. Uh, you know, it, I mean, that's really not okay. You need to just say, hey, I believe in it and I'm going to go after it. Uh, also, you know, a lot of um, women starting out business, they always assume that their income is not significant or is not the one that's driving the household. And that's why they often feel demotivated. Um, again, I, I don't think that uh, at least when you're starting out or or even otherwise, right? That, I mean, the money that you bring home, of course, that's important, but don't evaluate it as, is that going to make or break my house? Mm. <clears throat> because if you're going to do that, then you're never going to go out and, you know, 
stretch yourself really hard to achieve what you achieve your goals mm-hmm. if you're doing it only for the money then that's a different story but uh, i i think that's a big one for a lot of women especially in india where, who believe that hey you know it's not going to make a big um, make or break the kitty in the house so you know why take so much effort so it really depends on driving and what after mm-hmm. uh, and kids will always be there i think everybody's done it every successful woman in the world uh, or uh, every woman in the world successful or not has had babies and has had a family and everybody needs to do it uh, so it really depends on what you want right um, and that's that's how again priorities right uh, you need to set them right so if you i mean i, I think somebody wants to owe me this and i think it's very interesting that you can have only five things out of three out of these five things being health family sleep um exercise and uh, and um, business right so it depends on which five of these and work 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 stroke business so it depends on what which which three of the five that you actually want mm-hmm. uh, and then just go after it right so i mean you choose your three and then just go after building it it could be anything mm-hmm. but then you're making a trade off right so imagine everything in life is a choice mm-hmm. you decide what that choice is going to be for you and i think that's that's the best way to go about building anything that you want not only your business What what your three then? <laughs> uh my three of them is really a three and a half, right? <laughs> my three clearly is health, family and sleep. Okay. Uh right? So everything is is kind of positioned around these three because I feel if these three are in order, I can manage the rest very successfully. right uh so i mean i i i mean i don't have any guilt about not spending enough time with my family uh because i make sure that that's that's you know on the priority list i sleep well because uh, like we all talk about these days that um sleep deprivation is is like uh, the biggest thing that's affecting most people and it's the root cause of many um illnesses and ailments and the third of course is uh, like i said health right so if you are healthy Uh, and you don't take a day off it's perfect right because you're working all the time so i think and and i just feel like it works for me because uh, i mean i i just feel like it's easier when somebody else in the team is unwell or my kids are unwell but i am i am always running right so it's just easier to handle it the, that way than if they're all okay and i'm not okay mm-hmm. so i just feel like these three work fantastically well who are your business heroes um so there would be i think uh two of them one is uh, one would be of course steve jobs for mm-hmm. building a product that's so desirable and building the product i think everybody goes after building everything else but the product um so i think if you have a world class product everything comes by so i think it would definitely be him uh and the other one would be uh opera because she's done uh, she's done what very few people have actually been able to achieve which is um you know which is knowing her background and the way she's come to um you know the way she's built a brand for herself today i think that's commendable uh which just shows you that um, you know in spite of many uh, restrictions or limitations if you need to shine and you need to do things you're still going to be able to do it right and of course build that sort of brand which is um which is credible and even the way she's extended her brand to so many more things mm-hmm. right i think that's commendable because that's exactly what we're trying to achieve at kids stop press mm-hmm. like kidsstoppress.com is the overarching umbrella and the parent brand and we're going to have so many different verticals under that under that brand um like i said the radio tv the subscription program uh and the website and you know all our offline events that it kind of resonates so well that uh, you know you're building something that you never let your consumer sort of exit that uh you know that exit that that lifespan that they're spending with you mm-hmm. or similarly with apple right uh steve jobs built this product and this desirability and then you just keep adding more verticals so i think those two really really stand out for me L- last few questions then um let's say you met oprah uh for a cup of coffee what what questions would you ask her <laughs> ah you you got me on that one i i i actually have a long list of questions that i would want to ask her right uh so i think the first one up is how did she do it uh and especially with all the odds that she had right so coming from the background that she did 
uh, being black, how did she manage to do that? Because there was so much of adversity back then. So how did she manage to overcome that? Because I just feel like at times as you're rising high, there's so many people uh, that pull you back down. Um, and even the whole gender equality thing, right? Uh, women doing a talk show, starting out independent, building a complete media company now. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting how she's she's gone about doing it, right? Uh, so I, I actually have to be honest, Neil, I'll have to really um, think a lot of, think a, I mean, I'll have to actually think, uh, you know, to pick a place that actually serves up. Uh, is really actually probably sucks at cost. I sucks at the service, so I can get so much more time with her uh, and and make the most out of that coffee. Excellent. Uh, what excites you most about what you're doing at the moment? Um. Well, I think the most exciting part about my job is that everyday life's changing. Right. Uh, there is like what you learn today may be obsolete tomorrow. Uh, and technology is growing at such a rapid pace that I think that's exciting. The other exciting thing is that we are dealing with creatures who are just so damn unpredictable, right? You're dealing with kids at the end of the day and no child is the same, no parent is the same, no parenting style is the same. And every part of India is so different. So a parent in the North is very different from the West to the East to the South. So just trying to address every cultural landscape um, and social landscape uh, is is really challenging and exciting at this point in time, um, and of course, like I said, um, you know, just just matching up to technology. So I think that's really really exciting. What what you can do um, today with technology is is awesome, right? So every time we do like say a Facebook live with somebody, and you see so many different people um, joining in, be it not only from the metros but the but the most remote town of Bom- uh, of India, and um, you know, connecting so many parents. Out outside of India, right? So we have about 15 to 20% of our, of our readers actually coming in uh, from outside of the country. And and it's 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 exciting, right? Because the time they're tuning in different time zones, mm. uh, but tuning in especially to watch you. And, uh, and you know, when they, they, when they comment that, listen, hey, I think this really helped me or, um, you know, or I swear by what you say, or, you know, this has really helped me in my parenting journey. And, you know, I recommended X, Y, Z to also read it. I think that's like, the biggest high in in probably in my life <laughs> actually do you have like um <clears throat> any advice for digital marketing um because obviously you've grown really quickly um right. on, on this platform uh obviously you use facebook twitter etc right. etc any advice for our listeners uh so Starting one would out, be obviously. that yeah so one would be obviously that you know, there's so many different social platforms out there. Mm-hmm. So choose the platform that's right for your audience. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, so example for our case, Pinterest works wonderfully. Uh, Pinterest and YouTube work brilliantly well for us because uh, that's where a lot of the mothers go to and that's where they are. Uh, what's it? And obviously the second would be, uh, so, cho- so the first one, like I said, that choose the medium that works for your audience. Mm. You may, and choose the bandwidth that you have, right? So you may not be able to populate every single medium mm. uh, that you want basis, uh, basis, the bandwidth that you have, but choose the right medium that works for your business. The second one would be that uh, have differentiated content across all the platforms that you choose, because uh, it's very important uh, for your reader to, if, if they're following you across different platforms to find incremental value. Mm-hmm. The third would be that to, you know, disseminate content or whatever your product or whatever information that you have today on every different platform, because, um, Social is being so restrictive and uh, so cognitive today that if you're going to lose out, I mean, it's not like if I'm following you on all platforms, I, I am, I'm, I'm, you know, probably surfing to Instagram right now, but I missed your feed there. But hey, I caught up with Twitter on the, in the night, later in the day, and I caught you there. So, you know, populate maybe same content, different time zones uh, on different platforms, uh, but make sure that that your reader is also seeing differentiated because if there's differentiated content, like mm-hmm. I mentioned in point number two, um, the fourth would be that be early adopters of content that or social platforms that you think would work for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as they get more and more pop, more and more popular, um, you're going to have a hard time building that audience, right? Because they all get monetized at some point and then you're going to pay to get pay to get people onto your platform versus or your following versus building that all organically like we've done. Uh, fifth would of course be 
you know, don't be shy to um, build a whole new space. Like we've, we're, we're the only parenting platform in the country currently looking at podcasting and radio for kids, like a digital radio for kids. So, you know, in a way we've, we've pretty much started, um, you know, invest investing and creating that category. So if you need to do that, then be known for it. Like that's what our readers love us for that. If it's, if it's new, it's fun, it's exclusive. It's got to be kids top press because they keep doing new stuff all the time. So don't be afraid to try new stuff and, uh, um, and you know, just, just try a new, new medium for sure. And according to me, audio and uh, audio video, both are going to be, um, are, if, I mean, they're already really big, but they are going to be even bigger. So make sure that you capitalize on um, on that platform. Mm-hmm. And I think the last bit I would, which is the e- which is the hard, which is actually the toughest, is be real. Like there is just no being mm-hmm. perfect on social media. Uh, you just got to be real. I mean, there's there's no pretense because people can see through. Um, so it's very important to just just be honest um, and and let people see the real you. No, no, no fake news. No, <laughs> no fake news and no fake you, right? Because uh-huh. I like I said, they can see you and they can, I mean, see through it very easily. So, mm-hmm. Ashley, what about branding then? Uh, should startups uh, think about branding right at the start or should they think about it, you know, six months down the line, in your opinion? Um, I think it's very, you know, these are things that you should um, kind of, close out uh, early on I would say because you know you're 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 building a brand or a product right so and when you when you go through that exercise of building or branding you know a lot of things that you want to be and you don't want to be get very clear in your head as the as the leader Um, so I think it's very important to go through that exercise early on because you don't want to be um, uh, something to you know, like be everything to some people mm. and be something to very few people, right? So uh, it's very important to know who your audience is and uh, and and be, you know, be relevant to them, right? So instead of just being jack of all, you'd rather, you know, it'll help you filter out who your audience is, what you want to build, um, you know, what what, a, what does your brand, you know, what does your brand stand for? What does your vision stand for? So I think it's very important to go through that process uh, early on uh, because, you know, it, it just gets more complicated later on uh, as you go along six months or eight months or a year down the line. I know a lot of people who are two or three years down their business and they find it hard. Really, what am I doing? What do I stand for? Um, what, what do I, what am I recognized for? So it's very important to you know, go through that exercise early on because you'll clear out a lot of your doubts uh, for yourself. Mm-hmm. Away from this startup, what are your hobbies and interests? Um, I am, like I said, uh, you know, three out of the five things, right? So I'm a um, food and fitness junkie uh, and I, I, I'm, um, I practice yoga and I'm obsessed by it. Uh, and that's what helps me get my calm. And I love food. I love eating and I love cooking. Uh, and besides that... Um, and, and of course, reading, three things that drive me. Um, but I would say, yeah, hobbies would be really that. Mm-hmm. And, and and actually, maybe I, need, I, I think I don't create um, enough time for hobbies anymore because I just have too much on my plate. Uh, so really, except for, except for two or three of these, I haven't managed to find uh, time for anything else that I'd love to do. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite food? Uh, I think it would be Mexican food. Okay, cool. Well, what's your least least favorite food then? Uh, least favorite food, I think, would be North Indian food, right? Because I just find it um, just just too heavy and I don't know, not not particularly exciting. Mm-hmm. You mentioned books. Uh, do you, you want to uh, recommend any books to our listeners? Uh, yeah, so I read a couple of um, you know. So I read a lot of startup, um, you know, a lot of startups and startup. Uh, books and a lot of entrepreneurship books and uh, stuff like that. So I would definitely recommend Zero to One by um, Zero to One. I think every every entrepreneur has to go uh, read that one. The other one that I am currently, um, you know, that I'm currently reading is called, um, uh, you know, and of course Charles Duhigg Habit is something that they definitely, uh, you know, definitely should try and read as well. The other one uh, that I'm uh, reading right now is called. Uh, 
um, is the irrational um, is the irrational mind, mm-hmm. uh, and that's that one's really exciting as well uh, because it it just talks about. Um, you know, it just talks about how you can create demand for a lot of uh, things that you want. Uh, so I would, uh, I would think that one as well. Even the tip of the iceberg, because that talks a lot about Indian Indian startups. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that one, uh, that one is, uh, you know, that that one's really exciting because it's important to see. Because I think everybody wants to know about the, you know. Uh, everybody's talking about the finished product hey that these guys did it like this and they're so successful mm. but if you go through the startup journeys of you know the five or ten founders that have really stirred up the Indian startup ecosystem mm-hmm. it's interesting to see that these guys didn't have it easy either right mm. so you're thinking dude you know typically questions that entrepreneurs would have should I get a tech co-founder mm. how much equity should I part with I don't have an office space how do I build a team um, okay I'm not doing well right now how do I bounce back or fundraising or um, you know just too much competition in the space or quitting my job not quitting my job how do I take that plunge so all of these questions kind of get answered there uh, the book I was earlier mentioning was Predictably Irrational mm-hmm. by um, Fan Early. Uh, so again very very um extremely uh, interesting so all of these books i mean um, they they're just uh, they're just great reads mm-hmm. you mentioned india startups do you have any like favorite indian startups um i think um i think when i when i read this book uh, the tip of the iceberg uh, it was interesting how uh, you know the paytm founders uh, journey was like he wasn't educate i mean he wasn't um, you know he he didn't Grow up. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't educated in the uh, typical Indian uh, English-speaking schools, but actually was from a small town. And how he went about, and how he actually gave away forty percent of his company to somebody who just lent him office space and some servers and computers. And uh, you know, so he gave away forty percent of equity for that. And then he how how he bought that back, mm. and how he pivoted at the right time to create Paytm. Uh, I think his journey and his. Um, you know his his whole uh, sort of uh, journey is like is something that really uh, stood out for me, uh, and I think uh, he's built something that that has especially in the last three months kind of really stirred uh, the really stirred the Indian economy. Um, so I think his his journey really stood out for me. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Hello, Jodi. Thanks for coming on the Indian Startup Show today. Thank you, Neil. Welcome. I'm happy to come on board. Excellent. Please tell me what you're building, please. So I'm uh, I am co-founder of um, Cubol. Um, Cubol uh, provides a big data as a platform service on the leading public clouds. Uh, so we have uh, our service now uh, available on Amazon. Uh, Microsoft Azure platform as well as the Oracle platform. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we take a whole bunch of um, analytic software, uh, mostly from the open source domain. Okay. And, and we uh, put it all together and um, um, provide it as a service in the in the cloud. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the you know we've, we we have quite a few customers at this point, some very large names that people might recognize. For example. Uh, cap cap companies like Lyft and Ola, uh, you know, social media companies like Pinterest, uh, media companies like Disney, and so on. And uh, uh, or uh, the key thing that you know the differentiation for us is that we make big data very easy for um, uh, companies. You know, they they essentially get a pre-built stack which is extremely easy to use. They can onboard uh, you know hundreds of analysts uh, in some cases onto the platform and get them productive very quickly on analyzing big data. Mm-hmm. And we make uh, extremely efficient usage of cloud resources. So that's sort of our second USP, uh, where you know uh, we uh, have built great technology in uh, sort of mating these open source analytics engines like Hadoop and Spark yep. to the cloud, uh, made them auto-scaling, elastic, and, uh, and a whole lot of sort of you know, magical stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what that translates into is both, again, use of, ease of use, where you know, people can just sort of uh, set some, you know, configuration stuff and just like lights out operation, you know, they can just sort of, uh, we, we take care of automatically of managing and running these clusters, but also it, it helps save companies enormous sums of money. And so, you know, we see extremely large data pricing companies use our services uh, to great advantage, you know, because they are able to, um, uh, frankly, save on a lot of cloud computing resources by uh, the all the automation and intelligence that is baked into our stack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's sort of Cubol in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you come up with the idea? And how long have you been doing this now? 
Sure. Uh, so we are about five years old. Um, so the company started uh, uh, when uh, myself and my co-founder Ashish, uh, we uh, both were leaving Facebook. So we had sort of spent about four years in Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we wanted to do a startup coming out of Facebook. Uh, so one of the things we had built at Facebook, uh, which we were very well known for was, uh, uh, first of all, you know, build uh uh, sort of bootstrap the Hadoop environment in Facebook uh, and sort of, uh, you know, lead the team and the service, internal service at Facebook. But also we were uh, somewhat famous as uh, the original authors of Apache Hive, mm -hmm. which is a well-known sort of a project in the big data open source space. Um, and uh, so coming out of Facebook, the opportunity we saw was, we, we our thesis was that uh, the cloud is fundamentally a superior architecture that, you know, we, we felt like longer term, uh, the clouds and particularly the public clouds uh, would sort of, you know, uh, be the place where most of the computing would be done. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, really loved the SaaS model. We thought that was the right model. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in our stint in Facebook, you know, we had realized that while open source software was abundant, you know, it was like all free, like there's tons and tons of software. There's so much software that people can't figure out, you know, what software to use. Um, but putting it together and, Converting it into a service that a business can use is very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, the integration has become very complicated because of the the profusion of projects. Uh, you know, upgrading it, uh, making sure it all works, scaling it, making it work reliably, uh, and so on. You know, ensuring security, governance. There's like whole other set of things that you could worry about when you run a service. So we we were very sure that you know that that was the place where uh, customers and users you know, needed help, you know, how to convert all this free software into a service. So we loved the SaaS model. And of course, you know, finally we loved uh, databases and, you know, sort of we are like sort of systems guys, you know, so we, we love data processing and the databases. And so we saw an opportunity to, um, you know, sort of combine our passion, which was like sort of, you know, as programmers and builders of sort of, you know, large scale distributed systems, to analytic systems, that was our passion. And then we could sort of made that to, uh, you know, interesting technological trends in the sense of, you know, sort of cloud sort of emerging as a new hardware platform and also, you know, sort of have this nice SaaS based business model out of it. And so everything sort of came together for us and we sort of, you know, started this venture. Uh, now, of course, like any other uh, startup, you know, there have been sort of changes in sort of direction and exactly sort of the details of what the offering are and who the customers are. And, we, and there's been a lot of learning lessons as well. But um I would say in general, you know, the overall thesis is sort of still the same. Cubol is essentially represents the intersection of cloud, SaaS, and big data. Mm -hmm. And what were the early days like? I mean, how long did it take you to get your first customer? Um, right, that's a great question. Um, so um, i try to recollect here, you know, so I think... Uh, I remember we started off with a, a sort of a two-person office in you know, Mountain View, uh, Bay Area. And uh, we, we talked to a whole bunch of customers and... Um, uh, essentially, what people told us was, uh, hey, you guys uh, uh, wrote Hive. You really know the space. Uh, we're trying to do some stuff in the cloud. Um, yeah, the, the stuff that's out there today, it's not all that great. Can you sort of help us do it better? And we had other ideas, but, you know, I think this is where the sort of the directional things come in. You know, like we said, okay, fine. You know, if that's what people want. That's what we'll go and build. Um, so we started building this uh, little, I would say almost like a prototype project, you know, said, okay, fine, let's try to do a little application that sort of, you know, takes in sort of people's uh, SQL queries and just runs it in the cloud. And of course, you know, on the back end side, we, we sort of already uh, had a lot of expertise in setting that we know how to sort of put together a somewhat interesting back end offering, you know, which with sort of auto scales and all this stuff. And I remember our first customers were uh, companies in the Bay Area. So uh, Cora, you know, with a yeah. very similar um, uh, you know, question and answer site was, uh, I think probably our first customer. Um, uh, then there were also advertising companies. I remember uh, who came on board very early. Uh, uh, the one name that brings to my mind is uh, media math, which is now a fairly big name, you know, now, now they've gone public. It's, it's a very successful, uh, ad tech firm, but they were also pretty small back then. Uh, in Europe, I think there was a company named YD world. Uh, I think it was out of Amsterdam. I think they've changed the name. I, I don't actually mm -hmm. quite remember what the new name is. So we had a very small, you know, uh, two, three and a handful of sort of, uh, you know, early customers who sort of uh, came to kick the tires and they were pretty happy. Uh, you know, they paid us and they stuck on. And uh, yeah, that was our start. Excellent. Uh, let's talk about big data then. Uh, for those people who don't know, you know, what actually is big data? All right. Uh, big data is a buzzword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, let me uh, just put, put it 
little bit sort of uh, in context. So I think what we started seeing uh, when, so we, I, I was at Facebook and then before that I was at Yahoo. So I think with the advent of the internet industry and particularly, you know, explosion of social media and now mobiles and of course sensors and IoT and stuff, you know, we've seen a profusion of data sort of uh, data and data sources, right? Uh, uh, in the last, uh, I would say maybe 10 years, right? Um, and uh, uh, I, the, the differentiating, you know, and, and we've always, you know, like data pricing is not something new, you know, data pricing is something mm. that computers were designed to do uh, almost from day one, right? But that was the first, was the most important use case for something like IBM mainframe as well. Uh, but in this new generation, right, where we have so much profusion of data, I think what has changed is the amount of data um, and, and frankly, the value of data on a, let's say, a per gigabyte basis, right? I mean, uh, one of the things I always say is that uh, when you record a transaction, which, you know, let's say you went to a grocery store, you bought a, you know, um, a gallon of milk, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, you, you record the transaction in a database, uh, versus, you know, you're, you're showing, like, free advertisements to people, um, um, which, which, frankly, are, like, almost worthless, you know, and, and you're also storing those transactions in a database. And the value of these transactions, right, as stored in the database is obviously very different, right? One of them has a very high dollar value associated with it, the other one doesn't, right? So we saw this uh, profusion of big data, like really large amounts of data, but also very cheap data. You know, you, you couldn't like spend the kind of money storing and processing this data that you used to back in the old days when you were sort of, you know, generating small amounts of data of high value and processing it on mainframes and so on, right? Uh, and te- the technology industry, the you know the programmers, the engineers, we all responded to this new sort of equilibrium, right, of large amounts of almost worthless data that could be stored somewhat semi-reliably. Yeah, it was okay, you know, if you lost a little bit here and there, it's not really a big deal. Um, uh, but you had to like, really like sort of put enormous amounts of compute to process it in a timely manner, and you know. The, the people we wanted to do this processing were also changing. You know, it wasn't just the old world DBAs and the SQL programmers, but it was all the engineers, you know, who were working at companies like Facebook and Pinterest, Quora and so on. Right? They were saying that, look, you know, I want to I want to access this data. This is my data. And this is the data coming out of my application. I want to write Python against it. I want to write Scala against it. I want to write Go against it or whatever have you, right? So um, in this new world, you know, so this is the world that sort of, came to be described as big data, right? Now, big was one part of it, but there were many other parts of it. The the sort of the relative lack of value on a per gigabyte basis, the new kinds of users who wanted access to this data. Uh, people have also talked about the velocity of the data, you know, the, the rate at which it is produced and the need to process it in real time. So there were a bunch of dis- distinguishing sort of hallmarks of the, so, the so-called new the big data versus like, let's say the old data or, you know, whatever the Oracle databases perhaps, right? Uh, and, and so... So the, you know, uh, and a whole bunch of technologies, you know, emerged to tackle this new problem domain. I think these terms are very familiar to a lot of people, right? Uh, like, uh, namely Apache Hadoop was the first sort of, you know, important, uh, really important, famous project that came along. And then, of course, you know, we wrote Hive, which also became very famous. Um, but since then, you know, there's been a lot of other projects that have sort of uh, uh, acquired uh, even greater statuses, right? Like, so Apache Spark, Kafka, um, and I could go on and on, you know, there's like, uh, at least uh, um, half a dozen projects out there, you know, that sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, are closely associated with the space. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, so now this big data space is dominated by these this ecosystem of technologies from the open source to store and process the data. Mm-hmm. And and that's, you know, that's basically the business uh, that we are in and, and that's what we are experts at. Mm-hmm. How, how big do you want to go with this then? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, you know, we would obviously love to see the scale um, as much as possible, uh, uh, and it's 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 going pretty well. Uh, you know, I think um, we had picked on a couple of um, uh, relatively correct sort of trends. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you will notice if you uh, sort of there are two winds blowing here. You know, one is the wind of big data, which is you know of course large and large amounts of data, the need to process it, and you know we are also seeing with this deep learning and AI and you know, all these buzzwords that are new buzzwords that are floating around. And I think big data is a little bit of an old buzzword mm-hmm. that the need to process this data and and to it just keeps going up and up you know there's just new kinds of technologies new ways of sort of mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, processing and mining this data that you know people are continuing to dream up mm-hmm. and and which are becoming very popular right so big data is one huge trend behind our back the other big trend behind our back is the public cloud you know if you uh, uh, it's always interesting even as an entrepreneur to sometimes you know pick up uh, one of these gartner or idc research reports and one of the things i was reading recently was 
how the probably the single biggest trend in the information tech technology market today is how companies are thinking, planning, and working on migrating their uh, IT stack to the cloud, right? And that's leading to a lot of disruption and opportunity in the IT industry. So, uh, so you know, fortunately, you know, I think so with these two winds behind our back, you know, I think we can go a very long way. Uh, you know, the cloud market is obviously uh, like almost like close to infinite. Like the, the size of the total IT market is so big that it just sort of boggles the mind. It's like, you know, billions or trillions or, you know, some, some, uh, some astronomical number. And big data is also a fairly large, you know, and growing chunk of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are, you know, growing very fast. You know, we are easily growing north of 100%. You know, it, it, it sort of varies a little bit, but, you know, somewhere between 100 to 200% is sort of the kind of a growth that we expect to see. And uh, uh, if we can, you know, continue this for a while, you know, I think, you know, we'll have very substantial revenues uh, soon. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So you said the, there's loads of more emerging technologies. How, how do you keep on top of things then? Uh, that's a great question. You know, actually, that is one of the hardest things uh, in an area like this where there's so much new stuff happening. Um, uh, so, first of all, you know, uh, I think the, the most important thing about building a technology company is having very strong technology people on your team. Right. And that's basically, that's the only thing that we have, you know, we don't really have any other assets. So I think the first answer to that question is that, you know, we should be able to hire, retain and sort of, uh, uh, you know, be able to make productive, you know, highly expert sort of technologists uh, who can, uh, who are are sort of, you know, um, who are are going to help us, you know, sort of uh, understand these new technologies and sort of, you know, um, build on top of them and sort of, uh, you know, add value and so on and so forth, right? Uh, 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 So that's number one. The second thing is, of course, you know, we are also now a company with a fairly large customer base. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are able to, uh, you know, see what's happening in the market. Right. We, we no longer, you know, unlike, you know, when you are a very small company, you know, you're sort of guessing, right. Or whether you asked you know, how you get started, mm-hmm. you sort of guess the market, right. You just sort of take a shot at it and maybe it'll work out. Maybe you want a uh, nice thing is, you know, with, with the, you know, we have now 200 plus customers, we, we know where the market is going, right. What technologies are catching on, what aren't right. So we can sort of get a, you know, a sense for it. Um, now you, you can't be completely customer driven, right. Because, of the old saying about Ford and like cars and like sort of how people would have wanted a faster horse. Uh, so you have to, I think, do both, right? So you have to have your feet on the ground and listen closely to what customers are saying, but at the same time also uh, have, you know, great people on your team who are sort of, um, you know, great at innovation and learning and who are, you know, analyzing what's new happening in your space and sort of, you know, figuring out, you know, how, what we should do in the space, what, you know, what is the possibilities, where can we add value uh, and so on. So I think these are the two things, but having said that, this is a very big challenge, uh, but, but we are trying our best. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, you said you spent time at Facebook. Um, you know, what, what was the best thing about working for Facebook? What was the best thing? Uh, free food. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, everybody's basis is a little bit different. Uh, so I worked for a long time at a little bit sort of more classic sort of enterprise companies like Oracle, Network Appliance. And then finally I did work at Yahoo. So I had some exposure to the internet industry. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I had worked for um, a company as fast growing and as dynamic as Facebook. Um, so I think I really enjoyed the fact that we were growing like crazy um and and the fact that that presented a lot of opportunities to uh you know build things you know i'm, I'm fundamentally an engineer and a builder so that's what excites me that's why i joined facebook and so thankfully you know i was able to be part of a, a great company in a great sort of uh, growth period and i was able to contribute and build a lot of things i think that's probably the first thing that comes to my mind uh but of course you know the, it, it was also a very different company frankly from others i had worked for in the sense of um, having frankly a much younger pop, like sort of engineer profile, right? You know, obviously with uh, Zuckerberg, uh, I think he was 26 at that time, sort of heading the company and having started the company, and a lot of his buddies and uh, sort of you know people from around his social circle, sort of being key people in the company. Uh, it was also a very different company for me, you know, with so many young people. It was very, it was different and good, you know. I, I, I uh, you know. The infectious energy, you know, because naturally, you know, there's all the people who are young, who are not cynical, who haven't seen the world. And so for them, the world is full of possibilities. And they're very, very talented and extremely talented and smart people. Um, uh, that was actually one of the things I, I noticed, you know, I, I, I saw engineers at Facebook that 
were just remarkable. You know, I had never had the opportunity to work with, uh, you know, that kind of caliber of engineers, extremely high caliber engineers with a lot of energy and positivism out there on a mission mode to change the world. So I think that was very, uh, um, uh, an exhilarating experience. You know, uh, there was something very unique about it, which I don't think I had previously, or I don't know whether I'd have again in the future to be a uh, part of. Um, uh, and, um, and yeah, finally, you know, like, uh, I think the culture was awesome. You know, I think, uh, of course, you know, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, in general is known for its great culture. And I think that was true for the companies I worked for as well. But every time you sort of go to one of these newer generation companies, it, it gets better. Right. I mean, so like, frankly, the, the quality of the food and stuff was, you know, um, I mean, it's a very small thing, but it was, it's pretty good, you know, <laughs> so that was also yeah. good fun, you know, uh, uh, really good sort of work environment and freedom, uh, food, uh, perks, uh, you know, great people to work with. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of uh, really good things about Facebook. So in 30 years time, what would, what would Facebook look like then? Do you think if you have to guess in 10 years time, 30, 30 years time, 30 years. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, oh, even, even 10 years time. Yeah. You know, uh, so 30 years, right. Uh, I, I, you know, it did, uh, unfortunately, I, um, I would have to say that, you know, if you look at any technology company, uh, it is very unusual for them to survive 30 years. Uh, uh, or at least if they survive, you know, they change, you know, uh, and I think, you know, we have lots of examples, you know, I, let's say IBM in the 60s to IBM in the 90s, you know, Microsoft in uh, whatever, right, 1980s to Microsoft in 2010, right? Google Google is sort of maybe middle-aged right now. It's not quite there. So, you know, unfortunately, in a time frame like 30 years, what happens is that companies essentially just get old, right? They, they sort of uh, are no longer the young company uh, addressing sort of emerging markets, they frankly, like almost all of them end up being very large successful companies if they survive that long, but usually uh, uh, addressing like sort of enterprise markets. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they move upstream to more stable markets where things don't change that quickly. There's lots of profits to be made. It's a mature market and so on, right? Uh, I think it is, it is almost inevitable that uh, if you look at the trajectory of Facebook or Snapchat or Quora or whatever, right? I mean, they always inevitably start with sort of younger populations. And so I think it's very, very hard for a company like Facebook over over a period as long as 30 years to keep up with that. I think in a time period like that, the, you know, 30 years is what, 2000 and um, um, up to 17, right? 2050, 2050, right? I think the, 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 the Facebook of 2050 is going to be invented by a guy who is not born yet, right? He's going to be like, 20 years old in 2050. So he'll be born in like 2030. <laughs> uh, so, so that would be my quick take. You know, I think in 10 years, I think the prognosis looks awesome, right? And I think uh, Mark has uh, uh, an uncanny understanding of his market, very, very aggressive and very willing to, you know, make dramatic acquisitions to sort of keep a stranglehold on the core messaging and social media market. So I think, you know, uh, with, with, with that kind of aggressive leadership and sort of market stronghold, you know, in 10 years, there'll be sort of like, uh, you know, I think maybe where Google is today in terms of uh, its market domination uh, and stuff, right? But yeah, in 30 years, I'm, I will be less sanguine and sort of, you know, I, I think it will become a much more mature and maybe less interesting. Company. Okay, let's let's talk about you then. Uh, is this your first startup then, would you say? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I had I have been working for a while. So uh, before, um, uh, you know, um, before starting Cubol, I had worked for, let's say, roughly... Um, uh, you know, like 13, 14 odd years. Mm-hmm. And uh, during some of the time, uh, I, I had tried out my hand at smaller companies. So I had tried to start a company in 2002 uh, with a few friends uh, that unfortunately did not go very far. And uh, I've also sort of dabbled around, moonlighted, you know, sort of like done things on the side, uh, uh, almost on a continual basis. Uh, but none of them went this far, mm-hmm. right? I, I have actually incorporated and written software. I even like sold a little bit of software before, but you know, it was still sort of very sort of, uh, I would say, you know, the, the, in none of my other companies I had hit sort of uh, product market fit, mm-hmm. uh, if you will. Right. Uh, and yeah, Cubot is definitely the first real startup mm-hmm. in that sense. Uh, uh, but I, I did sort of, uh, the earlier experiments allowed me uh, uh, to discover myself a little bit, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, what I would enjoy doing in a startup, how much stress and how much, uh, you know, um, time I could put into it um, uh, and so on. So there's a little bit of, thankfully, it's a little bit of self-discovery that had already happened by the time I started Cubo. And so that really helped us. But yeah, this is definitely the furthest along I've ever come in an entrepreneurial journey, mm-hmm. you know, starting from zero to sort of, you know, uh, fairly, uh, you know, 200 plus customers, as I mentioned before. Yeah. So in a way, yes, but in a way, no. Mm-hmm. So any advice for first time founders, you know, what, what, what should they be focusing on? 
in your opinion? Uh, sure, yeah. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, takeaways from um, uh, having done this a few times and as well as growing this one. Um, I think the first thing, I, I think this is a very subjective question. Um, there is no single answer that sort of fits all people, but I'll give some generic observations. You know, first thing I think is that uh, startups uh, uh, take time to build, um, you know, for every uh, Instagram or YouTube, there are probably, uh, you know, many, many sort of companies that grow a lot more slowly and that require many more years to sort of get to sort of traction and a big size and stuff. So I think uh, for me, I would say the one, number one thing is, you know, uh, do something which you are passionate about because you're going to have to put in a lot of time into it. You're going to go through some ups and downs. You're going to have to balance sort of family and work life. And there's going to be a lot of like crap on the way. Right. Uh, and so I think, uh, if you're passionate about uh, uh, the area, the business, you know, whatever it is, like this must be some aspect of the business that you are really passionate about that you can sort of, uh, you know, keep to uh, stick to for a long time. And then I think that is the first step towards uh, sort of uh, uh, setting yourself up for success. Um, the, the second thing I think that uh, comes to uh, my mind, uh, especially for first time founders, you know, especially if, if there are people who haven't done this before is, um, to carefully consider different sort of financing models. You know, I think uh, when we, uh, when an average person thinks of startups, um, they always think um, f about the success stories and sort of, you know, um, billion dollar rounds and sort of hundreds of millions of dollars of raises, you know, uh, companies growing really, really fast and so on and so forth, right? Primarily venture capital uh, uh, model, right? Uh, but one of the things that I discovered um, uh, as part of this journey was that one should, you know, ask oneself, you know, whether what is the right financing model and is venture capital the right financing model or should we consider bootstrap models? When should one raise venture money? Uh, should, it, should, 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 should you raise it, you know, as soon as it's available or should you raise it if you um, actually think you can do something with it? Um, right. Um, so these are, I think, uh, important questions that I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs, um, uh, especially the first time ones, like I was when I started Kibble, I think uh, we uh, don't ask, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't think this is something that you can cover in a podcast, but I think there's something good that people should be, uh, important that people should be aware of. And I'll strongly suggest when they start off their entrepreneurial journey to talk to, you know, somebody who is sort of seen various sort of uh, choices and sort of uh, uh, get some guidance on how to navigate all the different options, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that are in front of you. Um, uh, right. Yeah. Those are, those are the two, uh, you know, immediate things I can think of. Yeah. Well, last few questions then. Uh, what are you working on right now? Any, anything interesting, exciting? Oh, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's a, you know, uh, a, a company at, uh, the size and the stage that Cubol has, has a very different set of challenges than when we got started. Uh, when we got started, of course, you know, I was just sort of sitting there writing code with a, very, a small number of people and sort of, uh, uh, uh you know, uh, awake late into the night, sort of, uh, building stuff. Right. Um, now, of course, you know, we have a fairly large engineering team. So I, I head the engineering team for Cubol, uh, worldwide. Right. And like we have, you know, anywhere from 70 to 80 engineers, which is a fairly big team. You know, it's, it's, it's way more than, you know, I ever dreamt we would come this far. Right. Um, so the things, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm of course extremely busy. So I think, uh, first of all, you know, at this size and scale, uh, you feel, um, like you have very strong responsibilities to your, your employees and engineers. You have very strong responsibilities to your customers, you to the rest of the stakeholders in your team, marketing and all this stuff. So I spend a lot of time uh, uh, doing not very sexy stuff, but which is just sort of, you know, frankly, making sure that, you know, everybody's sort of taken care of, right? That, you know, uh, uh, we're doing the right thing for all the stakeholders and sort of um, putting people in touch and sort of making sure the machine is sort of well-oiled and working and all that sort of, a fair amount of my time goes in that. Uh, but if I take out, you know, uh, all that stuff, which, which, I have learned to, I have realized that it, that's not so easy. And uh, I've also started realizing how it also is a little bit like computer science. You know, every problem is is solvable. You know, uh, you just need to sort of solve it, right? And so all these key challenges of, uh, you know, building an organization, building processes um, and all the stuff is also like not very different, in fact, from building anything else. You know, building an organization is, is kind of like building software. Uh, but I also continue to be... Um, very closely uh, engaged with uh, technology efforts throughout the company, particularly uh, things that are sort of more innovative and path leading, uh, because that's sort of my official title, right? I'm the CTO, right? So, uh, so I, I, I uh, you know, I'm very excited about 
many initiatives that you know are happening across the company. Uh, I will not be able to go into all the sort of the new stuff that is happening, but you know we are in general sort of uh, as as an industry uh, uh, segment, right? We are marching into. Um, I would say more and more cloudiness, you know. So, so when Kubo started, you know, we, we we sort of were in the cloud, but we 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 would spin up servers and we would do sort of stuff with servers, right? And and then those servers would be visible to customers. And one of the very exciting trends I see in the market is um, uh, people are becoming less and less aware of servers, mm-hmm. and they're saying that hey, you know I want to do this analytics thing, I want to run this SQL, I want to run this Scala, right? Go run it for me, right? I don't care, you know, what kind of machines you get. Uh, uh, how you get it, you know, I, I do care a little bit about the price you pay, of course, right? Because I'm paying that price, but you know, aside from that, I don't really care. So there's a very interesting sort of a industry transition happening, which is uh, going from uh, server, server-based server cloud computing to serverless cloud computing. Now uh, you may have the term AWS Lambda, uh, there are a lot of applications being built out of that. So we have, you know, a bunch of initiatives that are sort of going on internally uh, uh, where we are trying to become less sort of server aware and more serverless. I don't think it's a binary thing, you know, it's, it's kind of a transition thing. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, we're also, um, uh, I think I'm also excited by all the stuff that's ha- happening around streaming data, you know, as, as we sort of see this industry mature, you know, we're seeing streaming data, machine learning, deep learning sort of as emergent sort of uh, uh, or, or, or maturing sort of areas, you know, and so that's another area that I'm uh, deeply sort of involved in uh, trying to figure out, you know, what, what, how, who are the customers, who are the users, how we can, you know, add value and what kind of products we can build for the market segments represented by these technologies. Uh, and that, that's, you know, another very interesting area. Excellent. So if someone's listening to this and they want to get into the big data industry uh, or software, cloud, et cetera, you know, how, how, do, how do they get started? Great question and a question that's uh, asked very frequently. Uh, so actually, let me approach this uh, from... Um, uh, there is no single role for this entire industry. So I think that's probably the first answer, right? So for example, um, uh, if you're an analyst, you're a business analyst or a data scientist, right? Um, uh, that's sort of one segment, right? Where uh, the, the way you get into this industry is uh, by understanding and getting expertise uh, uh, with the tools that are popular in these uh, industries, like for example, notebooks, Python, Scala, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of sort of R, you know, there's, there's tons of sort of, you know, sort of um, analytic sort of tools that end users use. Uh, and I think a great way uh, there is to uh, not only learn these tools, but to learn these tools on large data sets. Okay. You know, and that's also where a player like Kubo can help. Like we have like, you know, uh, sort of free additions for sort of like, you know, data scientists and all this stuff, right? So they can come just play around but not pay us anything. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so that's probably uh, one one dimension, right? Uh, an analyst uh, learning tools with sort of, and, and there are very interesting data sets, you know, like Uber has a taxi ride data set floating around. Uh, Netflix has obviously many years back released uh, uh, data sets around the recommendations. And there are many, many other interesting data sets. So there's uh, real world data of, you know, sort of very interesting sort of value that you can sort of, you know, play around with these, uh, mm-hmm. these tools, right? Uh, the other thing that comes to mind is um, for uh, people who are more, uh, you know, uh, maybe a little bit more like me, you know, like who are engineers and who want to get into big data, I said, I want to build big data technologies, right? Um, um, that's another segment of folks. And I think they're also, it's very exciting, you know, back when, you know, I was young and I was going through college and uh, uh, sort of, you know, I was, I was you know, I always think, you know, the, the opportunities for us uh, to learn uh, new technologies, especially cutting edge technologies, was very difficult. You know, it was all academic stuff you learned in college, and then you had to like come and get a job to you know to get exposure to like real world software. Mm-hmm. But now today, you know, like it's all like open source stuff, right? There's just tons of like interesting cutting edge open source projects. And if you're an engineer and you have a, f- a passion or interest in sort of exploring the big data space, you know, just just you just need to dive into it, right? Just just you know set up some software in your laptop. Uh, you know, try some stuff out, pick some open source uh, uh, tickets, bugs, you know, there's tons of feature requests, uh, issues, whatever that just sort of waiting to be solved, just dive in, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that's, that's a amazing sort of, a, you know, um, uh, uh, um, era that we are in, right, where uh, knowledge is so democratized, right, the, the opportunities for learning, uh, even like commercial stuff are, are so democratized, I think that is just a really good thing for engineers. And finally, you know, like, I think you could also think about uh, people on the operations and DevOps side, you know, people who want to sort of um, uh, uh, run this kind of stuff, right? Um, 
uh, clearly, you know, that's another sort of skill set that is also in high demand. Um, uh, that's another dimension, you know, I think there it's more, more about playing around with the software, trying to set up um, uh, and so on. You know, again, you know, uh, in the cloud, you know, there's a lot of stuff that one can do at a very low cost. So I think for people in this category, uh, you know, they can, they can, uh, th- again, they don't need access to a large company with large sort of hardware setups. All they need is motivation and maybe a, a you know an AWS or an Azure account, and you know they can just sort of log in and play, you know, bring up some stuff, play with it, and and, and learn. You know, I think so. I think yeah. So I think there's this uh, you know no matter which dimension you come in from, whether an engineer or a DevOps guy or a analyst or, or whatever, right, or whatever else we can think of. You know, I think uh, such an open uh, field with both open source and cloud that you know you can come in and uh, learn stuff, and I think that's the first way of uh, sort of entering this area. Excellent. You said you mentioned you said you said you spent time in Silicon Valley. Who would you say is the most interesting person that you met? Oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't think I was that well connected. <laughs> uh, that's um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, clearly, I would have to say that you know, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg was probably the most uh, impressive uh, 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 you know person I sort of um, uh, uh, saw very closely. I, I you know, I, I, uh, it would be unfair to say that I worked directly with him in any capacity but yeah i think he was he was definitely sort of uh, in a small company you know he was somebody that i uh, saw very closely and i uh, was fascinated you know he, he was definitely um, amazing you know i think uh, 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 the, 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 there's obviously many many uh, interesting things about him but i think one of the things i used to think about when that this guy you know he was 26 then and he was running uh, already at that point you know what was the dominant sort of social media company as well as uh, one of the companies that was like the one of the most important companies you know in in the technology landscape whether i think that that was a time where the revenues were not so high but it didn't really didn't, didn't really matter right i mean it was a really important company uh, for the society right and i was just thinking it was, it was amazing that you know this guy who's 26 years age you know is heading a company like this and i was like man whatever what was i doing when i was 26 years old? it's like eh, not much you know i don't know <laughs> so yeah definitely uh, you know uh, uh, amazing uh, amazingly high achiever uh, guy, a lot to learn from, you know, amazing amount of passion and sort of uh, confidence and, uh, you know, missionary sort of uh, uh, zeal, you know, in changing the world. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would probably on, on first thought, you know, I would put him sort of as the most person, interesting person I encountered. Excellent. Hello, Shuresh. Uh, thanks for coming on the Indian Startup Show today. Hi, Neil. Great to be on the show. Excellent. Please tell me what you're building. Okay, I am the founder of Crayon Data. It's an AI startup based in Singapore that wants to simplify the world's choices. So what we're building is a unique choice engine that understands your taste at an extremely personal level Mm -hmm. and tries to um, essentially bring together a simplified set of four or five relevant choices for you at any given point of time in your lifestyle. Excellent. Uh, And where did you get the idea from? Well, uh, Crayon is my second startup. My first uh, was an analytics company called Red Pill. Mm -hmm. It is an extremely pioneering firm in the analytics space. Uh, We used to do a lot of work in B2B analytics for banks, telcos, and retail and emerging markets. Mm -hmm. IBM uh, acquired us uh, Red Pill in 2009. I spent a couple of years there as the global analytics leader. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me as I was working out there and when I got out to set up Crayon in 2012, is that, um, you know, that today, uh, while we have, while the world is awash with data and information, Mm -hmm. in some ways, this information and data is actually making life harder for us rather than easier for us, because earlier I had two or three bits of information, I could make a decision easily. Now I have so much information coming at me that, um, you know, by the time my mind can actually process all of this, understand all of that, there are so many contradictory pieces Mm -hmm that uh, in a funny way, uh, it's actually become harder. And all my life I worked in the area of uh, helping enterprises understand their consumers and how to market to them and understand their consumers' attitudes and behavior. And one thing that struck me is that uh, actually the process of choosing is actually becoming more and more of a misery while choice itself is magical. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and that's really what we said. I said, you know, there's really a big problem out here that needs to be solved. So that lead, led me to set up Crayon in 2012. Excellent. So is this for all industries or is this for specific industries, would you say? So Crayon basically works um, in what we call the lifestyle economy. So what we help people do is to understand choices that consumers make in lifestyle categories like dining, shopping, 
uh, travel, you know, choosing hotels and destinations, etc. Mm-hmm. So largely, I think what we cater to the the companies that we work with are companies that um, that cater to consumers in this field. So we work with credit card companies, we work with airlines and hotels. Um, so essentially, in these kind of um, and retail sector, etc. So these are the kind of companies that we work with today. Mm-hmm. And how, how's it going so far? Can you can you share, share, share some stats, perhaps? Well, it's a startup, and as, like with all startups, you know the idea is always great. Uh, we all think we'll conquer the world, and then we learn a few things as we go along. And as you go along, you kind of uh, realize you've got to do a few course corrections. You do a few uh, pivots, and uh, so all in all, I'd say we are we are for a four-year-old startup, we're doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. We'd like to have been much further along, and in certain views, we probably not lived up to the promise that we had. So it's what, you know, I'd call the exact, you know, the, it's what the Buddha would have called the middle path. We are roughly, you know, roughly where I guess a four year old startup should be. Mm -hmm. We work today with some of the world's top brands um, globally uh, in the banking sector. We work with Citibank. We work with um, Emirates National Bank of Dubai, with Mashrug, with Australia, New Zealand Bank, ANZ. Mm -hmm. We work with uh, HCFC Bank in India. We've got a big pipeline coming up. We also work with some of the leading um, airline and hotel companies, Emirates Airlines, Caesars Palace, and Las Vegas, etc. So, as a company, I think you know if you look at our logo list, it's pretty you know top tier. We probably, for on behalf of these companies, process anywhere between ten to twenty million customers every month. So again, not too bad. Is that where I'd like it to be? Is that no? I'd have loved, loved it to be you know ten times the size right now. Mm-hmm. But um, that, that, that startup world, you know, you're learning as you go along and you're making some course corrections and uh, we've had our fair share of mistakes. But we, I reckon we're in a pretty good place for takeoff over the next two or three years. Sounds exciting. Um, you said you so four years old. What, what were the early days like? Uh, you know, how, how long did it take you to get your first customers? Well, we were a bit lucky because it's my, like I said, it's my second startup. It's my co-founder's third startup. We've had three exits between us. So I think we didn't have a problem getting clients. Mm-hmm. But what we did discover is that the AI engine that we were building, what we call a choice engine, was a little bit advanced and uh, probably a little bit too far ahead of time in the early days. Mm-hmm. So when we went in and talked to clients, everybody would say, wow, you can do that. And then it would take a long time to essentially close the sales and even if we close the sale, it would take a long time for them to actually implement a really different, innovative solution. And one of the things we realized in that um, in that journey was that um, sometimes you don't want to be too far ahead of the market. Mm-hmm. So I think we also spent a fair bit of time dialing down um, <clears throat> the innovation quotient and trying to solve some of the problems that the enterprises that we serve have today even as we are trying to keep our differentiation in terms of uh, what's cutting edge in the technology. But interestingly, last year, Gartner, you know, we'd work in an area that's called digital personalization. So what we do is when we go to the enterprise, uh, Neil, we essentially help the enterprise personalize the entire, um, you know, lifestyle experience for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gartner, last year in August, had done a survey where they ranked us among the top 40 such engines in the world, um, put us in big companies, the IBMs, the Adobe's and, and people like that. But um, at that time, what they said is that this is still a market for early stage innovating innovators and not really for the mainstream. And it would take two years uh, for it to become adopted by most companies in the world. Mm-hmm. And certainly in 2017, we're beginning to see that more and more people are realizing that unless they get digital, unless they're able to get completely personal with their customers, unless, you know, they, I mean, every bank needs to understand its customers as an individual mm-hmm. and completely personalize the lifestyle experience for them. And the same goes for a hotel and an airline. And that's something that we struggled a bit to convince people on the first few years. Mm-hmm. Now we see more and more people when we walk in saying, yeah, I need that and I need it now. Mm-hmm. Earlier it was, I need it, but should I do it now? Mm-hmm. Or is this a nice to have? So it's kind of moving into the must-have category, and some of it is just time. And how, how big is the team now? Uh, we have about a seventy-people team. Uh, we have a development center, largely center, largely in Chennai, in India, mm-hmm. and we have our corporate headquarters in Singapore. We have a few, um, you know, product leaders and salespeople here, and we also have um, 
uh, sales teams in New York, London, uh, and the UAE uh, in Dubai. So we're reasonably global, but most of the team, most of the 70 members actually sit in Chennai right now as we speak. Sounds very ambitious. I mean, how big do you want to go with this then? Well, uh, you know, I'm never a great one. I've always believed that you don't actually do a startup with an exit strategy or a number in mind. But I think it's good to have a directional goal. And the reason is that, you know, the moment you have an exit strategy, then you're actually trying to not build something to last. You're trying to build something to sell. Mm -hmm. And that always means that you end up compromising your core vision. So uh, our whole idea was when we said we want to build this choice engine, we just said, listen, today, not that Google can't do it, but that, you know, Google really gives you a lot of information. But, you know, imagine if you're trying to find a... Let me make this personal for you, um, Neil. Imagine if you're trying to find a restaurant and you come to Singapore. Mm -hmm. Again, lack of information is not your problem, right? You can always find a Google search. You'll get a million results. Mm -hmm. You can look at reviews. You'll get probably thousands of reviews. Most of them will be conflicting. You can call 10 friends on Facebook and ask them, hey, where do I go? And you'll get hundreds of recommendations. Again, they'll be deeply passionate and widely divergent. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 30 or 40 minutes, you'll know closer to finding something because you don't know exactly what's the right thing with all this mass of contradictory information. The engine that we try to build says, listen, it understands your taste so well that what it's able to do is to say, hey, Neil, uh, we know you like Japanese and teppanyaki. We know that you've been on a long flight and you want some comfort food. Um, <laughs> there's something close by to your hotel, but you like quiet places. Uh, and this one's not quiet. And there's something a little bit further away, but it's a little bit quieter and something that's more likely to be in line with your taste. So what it's doing is it's looking at your taste, it's looking at the influences on you, the current context you're in, your past behavior, mm -hmm. and it's combining them all to come back and tell you, here's something that you can, um, uh, that there are four or five choices that are actually relevant to you. And it's learning from your choices as you make them. Now, for me, this is an extremely ambitious thing. You want to say how far we can go is extremely ambitious because there are, let me take the top billion, people in the world, each of us is making at least four or five such choices every day to eat, to shop, to travel somewhere, to see something, to see a movie. And it's that each of those choices is taking us 30 to 45 minutes on the average. So imagine if I looked at it and told you that today the world is wasting on the average about, you know, anywhere between 50 to 100 mi billion minutes every day mm -hmm. on the misery of choosing, right? And really, if I could have an engine that says that for these billion people, I could show you the answer to those choices in a few minutes. You're saving a huge amount of time. So I, directionally for me, I mean, that's really the thing is, can we serve a billion customers with this um, with this engine? That would be where I'd like to take it. Mm -hmm. um, luckily for us, we're not trying to do a B2C model. Uh, you know, trying to get a billion customers in today's world where it's dominated by Facebook and Google and Twitter and, and Apple and Amazon is going to be extremely hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the B2B to C model, I think it's a lot easier for us to get there because if I work with, let's say, the top 10 or 15 global credit card companies, probably combined among them, they'll have more than a billion customers, right? If I work with telcos, if I work with 10 telcos, they probably have two or three billion customers. The same thing goes with hotels and airlines. So what it gives us is by actually going through a B2B2C model, it allows us to actually work through the enterprise and uh, solve the problem for more uh, customers every day. So. Uh, we're at the early stage of that journey. Like I told you, we're serving about 10, 20 million customers every month through our engine. <clears throat> and uh, we hope to end the year with about 50 million in the engine. And in the first 1 million is always hard. The next 5 or 10 is like hard. Mm. The next 10 is a little bit easier. We hope to get to 50. It'll be slightly easier. Mm -hmm. But we hope that from there to get to it, get it to 500 and a million, billion users, mm -hmm. 500 million or a billion users is going to be a lot easier journey. So I'd like to face the ambition in terms of when will the Maya engine, we call this Maya mm -hmm. or the magic Maya, when will Maya touch a billion customers every single month? That's really the ambition out here. Excellent. Unless of course somebody follows us up before we get there, which is also possible in today's world. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, let's talk about you then. Uh, what's your background? Uh, is it a technical background or non-tech business background? So my favorite story, Neil, is that, um, you know, I ran away from statistics, mathematics, and technology all through school and college. 
I generally fail the subject. And this is now God's way of taking revenge on me by making me do this every single day for a living. <laughs> and uh, so, no, I'm not a technical guy. I did a, I did an accounting and economics degree, undergraduate degree. I did my master's in, uh, in, in business administration. Mm -hmm. I went into sales and marketing, and then I worked in advertising and media. Mm -hmm. And for the first 15 years of my life, I largely worked in what I would call a, from 1985 to 2000, in what I call the right-brained approach to marketing. Mm -hmm which is that I did look at a few data, I would look at research and so on, but I tried to understand consumers through the lens of creativity as to how to deal with them. I looked at brands and brand appeal and so on. But somewhere along the way, I realized that marketing was becoming more and more left brain. It was led by data and technology. And that actually led me to set up my first startup, which I told you about, which is called Redbird in 2000, mm -hmm. which is an analytics firm. And now, um, I, you know, the more I get into it now, we're not just doing analytics. We started the analytics services. Now we're doing analytics as a product. So I'm getting deeper and deeper into technology and statistics and mathematics to, uh, but I still don't know. I'm not a geek. I'm not a nerd. I don't understand code. Uh, what I do know is, uh, Neil, is that I like to call myself an in-between spaces guy, which means uh, I can sit at the business guy and he can, you know, when they tell me a problem, I know how to go back and talk to a programmer or a coder and say, guys, this is what we might want to do with this to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And when the coder says, this is what I'm doing, I know how to take it and convert it into a, uh, a front-end user experience or a solution that a client can understand and say, this is how I can apply it in the market. So, I'm, you know, I, I worked in advertising and it was the same thing, right? So it's about, <coughs> excuse me, connecting clients and creative people, you know, one, one is left brain, one is extremely right brain. Mm -hmm. So my core skill set is, I think, uh, the ability to spot patterns and work in these in-between spaces. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you said this is your second startup. Uh, what did you learn from your first startup? My favorite story, Neil, is the story of the Chinese bamboo tree. And I don't know whether you heard this one. And if you haven't, I'll, I'll share it with I've you for the benefit of your listeners. So basically, the Chinese bamboo tree is a particularly hard tree to grow. You know, you, you plant it you water it and you fertilize it for a year, nothing happens. You turn up, you know it's a hard tree, so you turn up in the second year, you water it and fertilize it, fertilize it nothing happens. I mean, you're a, you're a persistent guy, you turn up in the third year and you water it and you fertilize it, nothing. Now, you know, you're about like, uh, you're blaming, you know, the universe, your family, your friends, uh, probably your dog, everything else and saying why but you know, you say, okay, I'm going to give it one last shot and you turn up and you water and fertilize the Chinese bamboo tree in the fourth year, nothing. And at this point you're absolutely about to give up, but you know, you have a, what, what I call a stupidity gene. So you turn up and say, let me just do it a little bit longer. I wasted four years on it and you water and fertilize it for the fifth year. And sometime in the fifth year, the Chinese bamboo tree sprouts and grows 90 feet in six weeks. 90 feet in six weeks. Now, the reason I share the story is that all entrepreneurship is the story of the Chinese bamboo tree. And that's something I learned. I mean, oh, there's an added complication. You don't know whether it's the fifth year or the fourth year or the third year or the eighth year. When, <laughs> and you don't know whether it'll be 90 feet in six weeks or it'll be like, you know, 20 feet in 12 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know how much it'll grow. But I, that story has stayed with me through my first startup and my second one that it's, um, persistence it's uh, having clarity of like your your vision and like you know just 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 mm -hmm. staying through as long as you can see that you're making progress so to me that is one of the biggest uh, learnings from my uh, first startup uh, lots of people told me why you're doing this nobody wants to do this nobody will will buy analytics nobody will buy analytics in asia etc uh, but you know ibm hasn't bought too many companies uh, East of Europe, and you're one of the few, I mean, companies that they have. So, I mean, that's kind of tribute to the fact that we were very early pioneers and we built a company that had, that actually created some pioneering value. Mm -hmm. So to me, uh, that was the reward, that, that was the Chinese bamboo tree growing 90 feet in six weeks, right? So, but it came, uh, it came in the ninth year. <laughs> Though to be fair, the first four years of Crayon were barren, and then in the fifth year, we actually started to grow, sorry, of Red Pill. The baron and we started to grow and between the fifth and the eighth year we did pretty well, which is what led us to IBM, which is what led IBM to buy us. So to me, I think that's the main story that I would give all entrepreneurs, which is uh, persistence. I mean, you know, 
you got to know what you're doing. You got to you got to have faith in your own uh, story mm-hmm. because if you don't have faith in your story, there's no reason for the people who work with you to have it, for your clients, or your customers to have it, for your family to have it, uh, for your investors to have it. So that is the uh, that is the main uh, takeaway that I at least had from my first startup. Excellent. It seems like you've done a lot in your life. Uh, you know, what what's left to achieve now? Would you say? I'm a firm believer. I'm fifty. Three and I'm a firm believer in the hundred year life, right? I think my uh, generation, not every one of us, and I'm not tempting fate with this, but I'm saying in general, I think with the advances in medical technology, we live to be a hundred. Mm-hmm. So the way I look at it is that I have 47 more years in which to do new things. And you know, for me, life is about learning something new. When I went into analytics, like I said, it was a challenge for me, but I went ahead and said, listen, I can do this and I can learn stats and maths and and then I went into building a product for the first time. I had to learn technology, or at least understand about technology and coding and all of that. So that's been a challenge. So for me, I think the way I look at it is that there's so much more time left to do new things, mm-hmm. to learn new things, and uh, find um, new challenges. And I like to challenge myself once in every three or four years, either on the professional and or the personal front. Mm-hmm. So when I turned 50, I went and climbed a mountain, uh, which was... Um, I picked an easy one. I mean, Kilimanjaro is not particularly hard, but it's still 6,000 meters and I never climbed anything more than 20 flights of stairs to my apartment. So uh, I'm now trying to write a book. Okay. And I made a commitment somewhere this year, I will try and complete this book. So that's new. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot left, Neil. I mean, you know, life ain't over at 53. Life begins. I mean, the way I look at it is these are the most interesting years of my life now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And away from the start, so what are your hobbies and interests? Um... Music is perennial. Music and movies and reading uh, are, 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 are what keeps me going. I'm an avid reader. I listen to a lot of music. I love watching good movies. Mm-hmm. I play a lot of sport. I still play cricket fairly competitively and well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think I'm very interested in public policy and more and more trying to uh, understand what is going on in economics and politics and how inequality is creating a world where I think we should all be very afraid. Uh, of uh, where we, the world is headed. Mm-hmm. And I think we all have also an obligation to find a way to um, uh, find solutions. It's not just some few politicians that have to do it or a few economists. I think all of us have a part to play in this whole um, uh, solution of what is the right economic model for the world. Separately, uh, one of the things I do love doing is uh, mentoring, coaching, helping any budding entrepreneur in any way they want to. Mm-hmm. Because I realized it's an extremely lonely and hard journey having been through it. Mm-hmm. So finding time to help uh, people who are doing their own uh, startups is a is something that I... I mean, the one thing I will prioritize over sleep is finding time for to help other entrepreneurs. Excellent. Uh, what, what should first-time founders uh, be focusing on then, in your opinion? Well, uh, to me, I think... Uh, you've got to have a inner... So I would say there are two things, right? You've got to have some clarity, some inner voice that tells you that you are solving a problem and you should stay uh, very, very focused on saying that problem is, one, worth solving and two, you have a unique way to solve that problem. Far too often, you will get a lot of advice from people, whether from VCs or friends or your employees or or even people like me who are supposed to mentor you saying why it will not work. But ultimately, I think one thing that a founder should do is to have that inner voice that you can always fall back on that gives you clarity as to what what problem you're solving and why you're solving it, why you think your take on that problem is is unique. The second thing that um, I would um, actually urge people to urge founders to do is, I mean, I told you about keeping the faith and persistence already when I talked about the Chinese bamboo tree. But uh, one of the things I, uh, I, I I keep telling people is that don't focus, uh, the persistence needs to be not towards an, 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 an end exit, but towards building something that can actually last. Mm-hmm. Because the moment you create something that can last, There will always be somebody who will say, I find value it and you'll get an exit. So it's a very funny thing. If you go seeking an exit, you're probably going to build a mediocre company because all you're thinking about is, I want to sell it to somebody who sees something in it. Let me kind of build something that they want. Mm -hmm. But if you build something that's really meant to last and can stand the test of time, you're 
in a funny way, you're bound to attract people who want to buy it out in some way or you you know do an IPO or something. So your exit will actually happen when you build something to last. So I keep saying the second one is that you should have the persistence and the faith to go out and build something that will last. Excellent. I mean, going back to the startup then, what, what are you working on right now then? Oh, well, uh, what am I working on apart from Crayon? I mean, within Crayon, we always have 20 ideas. I mean, I, there's, there's already a CEO and a leadership team that are running the firm on a day-to-day basis. So I focus on innovations and, um, and um, you know, what's the next new thing that we should be building. And that takes a certain amount of my time. So, for example, we're building this uh, AI taste spot, as we call it, that really... Um, uh, seeks to understand people's tastes and dining and then finds out exactly what's right for you right down to the level of saying, if you like a particular dish, that's the best place to get that particular dish, right? So we, so I, I do the new product and the evangelization of new ideas with, with clients inside the company. Uh, I also work with a couple of other startups which are trying to do new and exciting things in, uh, in analytics. One works in the area of visual analytics. Mm-hmm which is just looking at images and trying to find, make sense out of them and uh, helping brands and companies actually use that to, you know, to understand their customers better. One works in the area of, um, of creating an open source recommender that uh, recommend a system that can completely democratize analytics. It's taking what companies like SaaS and SPSS and all these big companies sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars and says, I will make it available for $1,000 a month to any enterprise that wants them, or even less. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with a couple of young startups that are doing interesting things in uh, analytics. So that's what I do on the professional side. Um, Personally, I told you I'm writing a book, and I decided not to write a business book, but to stretch myself and write a book on fiction. So Mm -hmm. that's that's hard. I mean, it's it's a different, completely different mindset. How's that going? Uh... Started very well, wrote the first three chapters, got the title, have the plot, have the characters, but finding time to sit down and write because, you know, you need to create space around yourself to uh-huh. get into the mood of the character, write that thing without being distracted by your day-to-day concerns. So I probably need to take a couple of weeks off and sit in a quiet resort somewhere or in a quiet place and then, and, and, you know, find windows like that where I can sit and write uh, you know, a few chapters at a time. Uh-huh. Uh, but I'm quite excited about it. I mean, if, if I can pull it off, I think it'll be quite a, you know, I mean, I would say this, but I think it's going to be um, an interesting book. Uh-huh. What was the title then? Uh, the working title is Love in the Time of Algorithms. Okay. It's about, well, you know, you, you can make out from the title. Uh-huh. It's about uh, a graph that can actually predict love. So, interestingly. So, you know, it's, it's but it's fiction. It's pure fiction. It's, it's fantasy. Excellent. I mean, you know, hopefully it'll solve this idea of finding a perfect mate. I mean, or it's a story about finding that person. Cool. Uh, last, Which, last of course, as you know, doesn't exist in the world. <laughs> yeah, cool. Last few questions then. Uh, I mean, do you have like heroes, like business heroes? Uh, or- There's the usual suspects that always, that, that always inspire you, right? And, you know, most of them come from the non-business world. And um, perhaps because I grew up in India, I've been reading about Gandhi or the Dalai Lama, Mandela was always part of this whole thing. But but again, it's not about them just for what they did. But I think for me, it's the personal struggle that each of them went through that really is the uh, is why I admire them. Uh, each of them had their own demons to conquer. Mm-hmm. Each of them had their own. So it's not about whether you know you achieve freedom or independence um, or the political struggle that they did, but the inner demons that they had to fight. Uh, and, and how they actually had to carry people along, uh, which really interests me in them. And to me, that's a, uh, they're also my uh, fallback, if you will, when I, uh, when, I, when I'm in times of trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, you know, I just go back and I look at them and I say, you know, compared to what they had to go through, this is nothing. Uh, on the business side, I mean, again, uh, I like people who are basically bold enough to tell the world that, you know, hey, you don't know what's possible and I'm going to go into it. And uh, I guess, therefore, you know, again, you'll pick all the normal names, you know, you'll, you know, you'll pick Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and people like that who are bold enough to say, I'm going to try something that ain't been tried. But, um, you know, I think the, uh, for me, um, uh, I think these are heroes not in a iconic sense of... Uh, 
you know, I want to be like them or emulate them, but I think I just want to look at what did they go through and what is in their mind. And when I look at what is in their mind, I think that's when you really learn something from their, from their story, right? I mean, you learn how you can go through failure. And uh, one of the biggest things that I take away from all of the names I mentioned, and certainly Musk is not in that yet because I don't think he's seen enough failure, but with all the others is what happens when you see failure and how do you react to it? And I go back and look at their lives to say, how do they react to failure? And the second thing that I really can take away from them is how can you be bold enough to step away from the crowd, including the crowd that you've been with all your life and say, I have to do something differently and I'm going to have the courage to do that differently. Mm -hmm. And um, if you read Long Walk to Freedom, when Nelson Mandela comes out of jail, he says that everybody else and even in his own, his own, his closest colleagues wanted to take a certain path, but he realized he had to step away and, and take a different path if he wanted to actually achieve what he wanted. And so to me, that those two learnings are really what I take away from my from those heroes more than, you know, the fact that they are heroes and they are like, you know, revered around the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's about, I think that again is a very entrepreneurial instinct, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what happens when you fail, but it's how you kind of learn from that failure and how you come back. And it's about how you're bold enough to say, I'm not going to walk that beaten path. I'm going to do something. I'm going to go some other way and, you know, I'm going to prove that that's right. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've had a long entrepreneurial journey. Uh, anything that surprised you? So, uh, obviously, I think uh, one of the things that has happened, Neil, which is a strange revelation to me, is um, how comfortable I am with the uncertainty and with the stress and the pains of entrepreneurship. It obviously helps that, uh, you know, I've been successful once and therefore I feel I can do it again. But uh, even in the first round, I somehow felt comfortable being an entrepreneur, being slightly different. And uh, so it was very strange to me because I didn't know I would be that way when I set out. I had obviously all the fears and the worries about being an entrepreneur. But here's a funny thing that happened, you know, and, and this is strange. Um, I was stepping away from an extremely successful corporate career. And uh, everyone was telling me why you're doing it. And the first two years didn't go well. And I was like, no money to pay the bills and all the usual stories like credit card debt, all of that stuff. And one thing I realized then, which was, uh, which I should have known on long, but I, you know, this is strange. And I think pleasantly strange, if you will, was that I realized my friends would still be my friends. Mm. And the people who loved me would still love me. And it wasn't about what I achieved. It wasn't about what I did or what job I had. It wasn't my title on the card that, that they were relating to. It was actually me as a person. And the fact that I was open, I shared my struggles with them and they were there to support me. And um, that was a moment of liberation, if you will. And my biggest advice that I give anybody is, you are not your title. You know, all of the people who sit inside large companies and who say, oh, I achieved this title. It is not the title, it is who you are that actually liberates you, finding yourself. So to me, that all my friends helped me find out that, hey, this is the person I am, and, you know, and, and you know, we love you as the person you are. We don't need you to be successful. They loved me when I hadn't sold Red Pill to IBM, and they love me the same I mean, after I've sold it as well. Jessica, uh, thanks for coming on the Indian Startup Show today. Thanks, Neil, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, please tell the listeners what you're building, please. Okay, yes. So I'm the co-founder of the Blueberry Trails. Uh, we are an experiential personalized travel company. You know, we design holiday packages uh, meant for those who are looking for, you know, a more immersive travel experience than the usual uh, sightseeing. So that's our, you know, travel philosophy. And we design holiday packages around that to suit your needs. So to suit your budget, to suit your sensibilities, to suit your interest. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, six years uh, based out of Mumbai, excellent. India. Uh, excellent. How, how did you come up with the idea? Can you remember the, the actual light bulb moment? 
<laughs> sure, sure. So, you know, um, I, you know, like most people who start off, uh, I was stuck in a you know corporate job and so was my business partner. Um, and we thought of doing something a little different in the Indian travel landscape. Then, you know, holidays were mostly about the usual, um, the, you know, the usual path and, you know, doing a lot of sightseeing and stuff like that. But uh, we wanted to like break the mold over there. So we started off with these um, offbeat weekend trips from Mumbai, where, you know, we would uh, inculcate elements of music. For example, we would take an indie band and make, you know, and go camping with them and put up a show, uh, you know, in the outdoors or do a movie screening or go stargazing. That's the genesis of Blueberry Trails, really. So, uh, you know, the highlight of experiences was essentially what we carried forward year after year as we added more products to our portfolio. So uh, then we added on, you know, trips around India. And then for the last two and a half years, we've been focusing on international destinations. And there too, we focus on, you know, local experiences and um, local, more immersive uh, things that you can do, which is beyond the regular uh, sites that you see. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been doing this since 2010. Uh, can you share some stats? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so far, you know, we've catered to 5,000 travelers. Last year, uh, we... Uh, you know, we carried out 300 trips, uh, close to 850 uh, travelers uh, last financial year. Uh, we're also growing at 100% YOY since the last three years. So, yeah, it's been a good uh, journey for us, a great learning experience. We are growing the team year on year. And um, also our portfolio has really, you know, uh, grown manifold. So currently we have 40 countries on our portfolio with 400 destinations, 4,000 itineraries um, and 12,000 experiences experiences that you know we you know spread it all together to form these trips uh, how does the actual platform work then say if i wanted to use your website what, what do i need to do uh, well, essentially, uh, you can drop in uh, your request on, we have a contact form or we have a chat function or you can call us on our IVR and we will take down your request with the basic, uh, uh, you know, inputs like how many people of, you know, where you want to go, how many days, what is your approximate budget and someone from the team will get back to you like, you know, in an hour's time with, uh, you know, a feedback on what we can custom make for you and then in 24 hours, you're going to receive an itinerary from us. Uh, post that, you can come back to us with any changes that you would want any uh, you know any kind of uh, you know any changes that you would want to make to the itinerary we will carry that forward and once that is done the transaction goes through so you can just pay on the website and your trip you're ready for a trip um, one of the key features of a blueberry trails trip is that you know it's not just about booking a trip um, it's also like we take pride in saying that we start from the Plan the inspiration stage. We go and help you with the planning stage, and then even while you're on the trip, we have like a follow-on option where we have a team member from our team uh, who follows you through the trip day by day, uh, hour by hour, trailing you on your every activity, experience, stay that you have coming. Uh, because for many people who are going on a customized trip, being in a foreign location on your own can seem a little daunting. So to take that fear away and you know to uh, ensure that there is no um, problem over there, we have this uh, shadowing um, function where someone from the team follows you around. Yes. Ah, yeah. So like I said, you know, we focused on a lot of uh, experiential weekend getaways from Mumbai and uh, really mean like both me and my partner, we don't come from a business um, background. So, you know, we come from families that say do a job, you know, uh, you know, be stable and stuff like that. But uh, so we told ourselves that, you know, we're going to do this for six months, see how it goes and um, we'll take it from there. Um, so in six months time, uh, we saw tremendous interest about this kind of travel. We were doing these weekend trips. We saw, you know, a lot of mainstream media were covering us. A lot of people said that this was completely new and they really wanted to be a part of it. And even though we were not making money, but we saw, you know, great traction. And that really um, helped us, you know, believe in this more. And we said, hey, you know, I think this is a great time to take a plunge. And we just went ahead and did it. And where does the name come from then? 
Ah, yeah. So, you know, uh, the blueberry trails, a lot of people ask us that. Uh, so essentially, you know, blueberry, in you know, it is a difficult berry to find. It needs the right kind of temperature and the right kind of conditions. So, you know, it stands for things that are not very easy to find. So, uh, you know, like peace or contentment. So it's a trail to find, you know, that sweet spot of your life. Um, yeah, that's what the blueberry trail stands for, you know. And also me and my uh, co-founder, Vishal, really like a blueberry cheesecake. So. <laughs> it all, you know, falls together. Well, let's talk about travel then. Uh, what are your what are your favorite destinations then? Um, well, uh, you know, I was just back. I'm just back from this one month a long trip. I was in Indonesia. Uh, I had an excellent time. I think it's the perfect mix of spirituality and a lot of adventure, and you know, it, and it's way beyond just Bali. So you have Lombok, uh, you have you know the Komodo Islands. So and you have Flores. Um, Indonesia is great for me. I also really like uh, Croatia as a destination. I think it's you know the mainstream crowd still haven't got there, and that you know it's a perfect mix of history adventure uh, and also great food so these two destinations really do it for me yes um, <laughs> in terms of uh, traveling what what is essential items do you go, do you take when you when you go traveling well, um, I personally am a very light traveler. So, you know, like I went on this trip, I had a backpack which measured uh, 10 kgs. Uh, it went 10 kgs and it came back, I think, 11, 12. Um, so traveling light, I think, is a must. Uh, a backpack is always, you know, your hands are free, so you can do a lot of other things with it. You can run with your bag. That always helps, right? <laughs> um, apart from that, yeah, I think uh, swimwear and sunscreen, um, those are essentials for me, sunglasses and uh a phone charger um, that I think will sort anyone out anywhere. So when it comes to your customers, what, what are the popular destinations and, and why do you think they are popular? Okay, so, uh, a lot, you know, for a lot of Indians, uh, traveling abroad is no longer a luxury. It is um, something that you do now once a year, at least to our target audience that we are looking at. So a lot of people are really exploring um, Paris and, uh, you know, the cultural capital being that. Then, of course, Barcelona. People are really interested in that entire belt, the Amsterdam, Paris, Barcelona. But what we're really excited about is seeing really keen interest on self-drive holidays, like, for example, Croatia. Uh, people want to do sailing holidays, uh, again, Croatia, Greece, Italy. Um, a lot of people want to see like, you know, Berlin, the offbeat side of it. So graffiti art and the Berlin Wall and, um, you know, that kind of the basically the Cold War uh, element of it. Um, East Europe is also huge for us. So that that is a very um, exciting trend for us to see. So do you, I mean, what do you think of like review sites then? Uh, like TripAdvisor, I mean, do, do, do you actually believe them or do you think they're like making stuff Absolutely, up? absolutely. I mean, for a business too, it really, you know, makes a lot of sense. So even if we have a vendor somewhere, you know, and we are monitoring their TripAdvisor reviews all the time and if they fall short of, uh, you know, a four star or something on those lines, we have to, you know, have a chat about uh, their service standards and stuff like that. If it doesn't work up uh, to our expectations, we'll have to drop reviews. But I think review sites are amazing for the traveler who don't use travel agencies like us, them too. Mm -hmm. And even for travelers who use us, like, you know, we tell our travelers that, okay, you're staying in XYZ hotel and they go and they check the reviews on uh, TripAdvisor or Booking.com, uh, sometimes Yelp. And, you know, I think it, it serves a huge, huge uh, message in being very transparent with your end travelers. I think that's super helpful for any business. And do you stay in hotels or do you use Air Airbnb? I mean, is, 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 is Airbnb big in India? Um, Airbnb is huge in India, but more so for the um, traveler who's, you know, planning the trip uh, on his own. So if you're looking for people who are, you know, going to Europe or going to these places for a longer haul, like say for a month or 20 days or something, for the typical holiday crowd, they still prefer to stay in hotels. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's a given, but also they're curious about Airbnb, but some factors like, you know, picking up the key from the owner, then these last moment cancellations, which unfortunately sometimes happen, um, that makes a few Indian travelers a little uneasy. So they choose to, you know, stick with a hotel. Um, there are a lot of boutique hotels in the locations that we cover. So we try to get in on that. So you have a mixture of both, you know, uh, the like the traditional architecture and the vibe of the place. Uh, at the same time, it's not just a, you know, a very hotel cold 
food kind of a experience so we try to merge both these things together and we always keep our customers right in the heart of the city mm-hmm. that also helps uh, being close to all the you know sites so we have uh, listeners outside india uh, yes. they may want to go to india uh, like for yes. f- first time visitors uh, any, any t- where should they go any, any tips <laughs> Absolutely yes people who are coming to India so India is vast so um it would always make sense to do like a longer haul like maybe a month uh, if you have more time then i would suggest 3 months but essentially if you're coming to India then you must check out the Himalayas i mean they are um a different world altogether i mean different world from the world that i live in here in mumbai or where you live in maybe you know in london um you know people live with such basic uh, necessities in such amazing landscapes um and at the same time um they're so happy so it's definitely a lesson in zen uh so that's something i would totally recommend so ladakh lahol spiti uh, they're just amazing places um uh, apart from that of course rajasthan because it's a mixture of uh, very deep heritage great food lots of colors great photographs um if you're into yoga then you know rishikesh is amazing you know to be in or kerala kerala for the whole wellness vibe lots of nice massages again good food backwaters so yes that's what i would recommend if you're looking for you know to party then of course come to goa goa is great so go to south goa they have a really nice party culture um yeah i think i got all those elements covered for a typical you know first time traveler to any country Excellent. um okay uh, let's talk about the business then um in terms of marketing how, how are you getting customers to the website is it email or social media absolutely yes so we are you know we've kept our website very open so we are big on social media we have close to like over a lakh um, followers on facebook we have over 11000 on instagram we are on twitter we 4000 plus um, so we focus heavily on content so we have blogs coming out we also focus a lot on word of mouth so you know travelers who come back they are happy with our trips their testimonials mean a lot to us because we have a 40% return rate of customers um, that really helps us uh, you know being in the personalized travel field um we like i said we are big on content we also focus a lot on pr but these are all people who reach out to us um and you know we get uh, just what you know presence in the media um that helps an off beat brand like us and what are your thoughts on the the indian tourism industry uh, it must be getting bigger and bigger right Yes absolutely absolutely it is growing uh, every year so currently like the personalized travel uh, market is like a 1 billion uh, dollar industry in india and that's customized travel that itself uh, you know speaks volumes about the kind of world that there can be also earlier you know it used to be just about packages and flight bookings even the bigger players like a make my trip yatra would focus on that but if you see slowly the focus is changing towards experiences and is you know focus more on personalized of travel because people no longer want to be you know just bundled into a bus and be shown uh, sites over a few hours they want something more than that and you'll be surprised at the kind of customers who come to us and they tell us you know we want to do something different and these are first time people who are going to europe but they're very very clear that you know we want to do something different so that's a landscape change that we're witnessing in india and so it's a very exciting time to be here right now what what's your favorite travel experience in um uh, my favorite travel experience okay so you know that's like just opening a candy store for me and i have to choose one uh but essentially um i'm quite big on like i really like food i think food is a great way to experience a place so cooking class somewhere uh would be great also there are these sites like um, eat with or you know if you have these private diners that people host in their house i think it's a great way to uh you know enjoy local food at the same time meet a lot of people who are there maybe expats who live in that city or uh, people you know locals who live there who want to meet other travelers it's a great place to meet people you know have so a lot of cultural experiences come right from there so that's a very exciting uh, space to be in like i've gone on these you know private dining experiences and met people personally mm-hmm. um and gone on hikes with them next morning mm-hmm. or you know gone pub crawling with them mm-hmm. next week so it's been like a great experience to essentially meet other travelers out there what was your first ever trip then can, can you remember 
my first travel so i'm from an army family right so for us travel has never been like so glamorous like travel has been a way of life so every 3 years you're just moving to different places and you're like you know seeing a different culture and you're just you know immersing yourself in that and by the time you get comfortable your dad is like hey it's time to move so you're constantly you know learning to you know adjust in different places um but from a holiday i mean i I remember my dad was posted in the Andaman Islands actually the Nicobar Islands where only army people um used to stay so I remember staying there for one and a half years and uh, yeah it's a very surreal experience very different from the holiday vibe that we all you know think of so yes um I also did Ladakh quite early on that was a very um intimidating experience for me then um I think it was gorgeous and again like I said you know the zen vibe you know how people live with so little and uh, have so much at the same time uh, so it was very eye opening for me yes so those were my favorites it seems that you go traveling on your own is that right um and do you do you prefer traveling on your own or do you go with friends and family Absolutely absolutely I I love traveling on my own um of course I mean I would love to travel with someone I love it could be my family member it could be you know a partner uh, that is something that is of course I'm not a lone wolf not at all I really enjoy that but essentially travel is a very personal experience for me so if I don't find someone who I'm really connected to then I would rather do it alone I would not just call a random acquaintance um but that's just my personal thought on that mm-hmm. And what what do you want to achieve in the next say 2 to 3 years with this business? Yeah, so like I said, I think we are in a very exciting time where the Indian travel um, landscape is changing in a very positive way. So I think in the next 2 uh, or 3 years we're looking to increase our geographical imprint. So from 40 countries I want to definitely increase to, you know, like close to say 50 55. Uh, we're looking at new revenue channels opening up for us. So we've essentially been focusing on the uh, you know the FIG traveler, but now I think we would be looking at corporate trips, the luxury segments. Um you know we have a lot of people who look at like these uh, you know they want to charter airplanes and charter very for sure um and also these uh, newer uh, categories like baby moons and bachelorettes uh, i think those are cute personal places that i would want to get into um and ensure you know these group of girls have a great time so that's why yes is there any like hot and up and coming destinations in india yeah absolutely i mean you know there's a lot more that's coming up beyond the usual rajasthan and beyond the usual kerala uh, we have you know madhya pradesh is huge it's right bang in the middle of the country and it has the khajuraho temples people don't know about it too much also it's not the easiest to reach mm-hmm. but uh, they are great destinations to go very deep um culture um apart from that uh, rishikesh of course is big on yoga but they also have like this adventure arm to it where you can go like jump you know bungee jumping you can do rafting so you have a mix of wellness yoga and this um apart from that uh, lahol spiti is going to be huge so uh, ladakh unfortunately has come under this travel boom a lot of people are going there and has really opened up for a lot of travelers lahol spiti fortunately still hasn't seen that boom because the roads are quite difficult to reach and you know the villages are really far off to reach anywhere it will take you 6 to 7 hours on the road mm-hmm. so you better have a great book with you a great music um uh, but these are amazing places to just go and spend 15 days of your time um you are going to come back a different person um uh, i felt that a lot of my travelers who've been there felt that too so i would definitely recommend uh spiti to anyone Um what will travel look like in 30 years time say if you had a, a crystal ball what 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 would it look what would it look like you think Well I think travel is going to be a way of life like it's no longer just it's right now it's still an aspirational bit it's still moving to the nice a need um, category thing I think um, moving forward 30 you know years in time travel is going to be a very basic part of life um, people will go out you know we will all be global citizens we'll spend time in different countries not just to go and see sights and taste their food but to experience different ways of life i think the world the global economy is going to open up and um you know people are just going to be everywhere and that's going to be a very regular way of life yes that's how i look at it so so you're a female entrepreneur um what you know, what is the scene like for female entrepreneurs in india Um well it's a it's a very exciting time to be here um there are there 
and I'm surrounded by a lot of really inspirational women who are doing amazing stuff in their um, own spheres and you know how you know we are being taught every day and we are teaching ourselves mostly how to break the mold and do something new and break away from the regular uh, patterns that you know people want to put us in and people still come to me and say you know congratulations you're this female entrepreneur i don't look at it that way at all i'm just an entrepreneur and i happen to be a girl and uh, you know that's the message that i want to send out to a lot of other women out there like not to look for any special uh, special benefits out of it but just to like make your way through uh, sometimes uh, you know you are not taken too seriously because uh, you know of whatever uh, you know biases that people have but i guess your work is going to speak for itself so let your work do the talking i think that's the best way to go so mm-hmm. so a lot of businesses do fail uh, but yours is still going after 2010 um you know why why do you think you're still going but most businesses fail perseverance, Neil, and uh, something that, you know, my mentor um, Alok Kejival always says that, you know, uh, you should, you know, don't look at the sexiness of the business. So you don't need to have like a fancy office and like, you know, 200 people staff. We have been operationally, uh, you know, we've broken even like two years into our operations and we plan to stay that way. So we are really looking at building an unsexy, even though we're in the travel sphere, but an unsexy business which makes money at the end of the year. We have a team of... um, 10 people, really enthusiastic staff. Each one of us are extremely excited to come to work every day. I think this is the highlight of our day and that's what keeps us going. So I think uh, it's just about, you know, believing in what we do. Um, Having that same belief in the team that you are running this with. Um, Giving credit to the team when required and uh, yeah, just persistence, nothing else. Because they're going to be great times, they're going to be terrible times. But to, you know, just go through that with the same amount of vigor, I think that that's what makes all the difference. And what are you like as a, as a boss? <laughs> that you have to ask my, uh, my team, but um, essentially I'm, I think I'm quite chilled out. I want to make every day an adventure for my team members. Like they really don't know what to expect and, you know, there's going to be like an ice cream date or we're going to go out for beers or we're going to just work till 10 o'clock because we have to get this deadline on. So I think every day is an adventure here in office. Um, I'm that person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what what would you say is the hardest bit about building this business? In this uh, building, this business, well, uh, travel business, um, A would be hiring, okay, to find the right kind of people because a lot of people come to you saying that, oh, I love to travel, you know, can I get a job? But they don't get it. Running a travel business is like running any business. And, you know, working for a travel company does not mean that you'll be sitting in the Himalayas or, you know, sitting in some beach in Indonesia. It means uh, just putting your head down and doing real hardcore work. So finding the right mix of people who are excited about this and are committed to it, I think that is one of the toughest bit um, of this. And also uh, seasonality. So now because we've been doing it for so many years, we're used to it. But, you know, they're good season, high season, low season. So that's something if you're not used to it, it can break your heart. So <laughs> that, yeah, that that would be a tough bit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, say I want to go on holiday. Uh, I mean, are there any like websites you would recommend in terms of like flights and hotels that, that you use? Yeah, so uh, Skyscanner is great for uh, rates, but essentially if you have, if you're a regular traveler, you should totally, uh, you know, try to make use of your miles, uh, that works best. But Kayak and Skyscanner are great. Uh, Also in India, uh, uh, Yatra gives some great offers from time to time, like cashbacks that also helps in booking uh, flights. Yes. So last few questions. Uh, What advice would you give to first time founders? Okay, uh, first time founders. Uh, So, you know, a lot of people think of starting a business because they're excited about it right now. And, uh, you know, they want to build a life around it. But you need to figure if this is something that will excite you five years from now or 10 years from now. Um, Second thing is uh, running a business is hard work. Uh, The sexiness goes in a year's time. It's like a new, you know, a new relationship. When you started, it's amazing. And it's date nights and all of that. But after one year, it's Uh, that's when the real thing, you know, really starts. So persistence. Yeah. So it should be something that excites you for a longer frame of mind. Yeah. That's essentially it. And who, who are your heroes? Uh, could be like business heroes or tech heroes. 
Um, yeah, so you know, Vishal Gondal, he runs Bookie. It's uh, tech, uh, tech and fitness. I really look up to him. I think he's done some great work. He used to be a gaming genius, um, and then post that he started Bookie, and uh, I really look up to him. Alok Kejriwal um, is someone else uh, I really look up to. I go to him time to time for advice, and he comes up with the most honest answers, and I really, really respect him for that. Um, yeah, these are two people I really look up to in the tech space, in the tech. Uh, entrepreneurial space and what are your hobbies and interests oh uh, well uh, i'm a i'm a music person so i love uh, music i like to a lot of uh, like listen to a lot of live music wherever i go whether it's just sitting by around a bonfire and chilling with people over there or in a really nice you know club where they're playing great bands so music and i love reading and poetry that's that's me yes so you just you, you've been to indonesia uh, where's next for you then on your on your bucket list uh, i don't make a list so even my indonesia plan just happened like two weeks before so when you're running your own business you cannot say that okay i'm gonna take a holiday like you know six uh, months later it's as and when so um i think i'm gonna go back to bali for a bit mm -hmm. but when that's gonna happen i am not sure uh maybe i'm hoping in the next uh one year sometime yes you know that when you run your own thing you can't like take off for a month or you know take off for longer times so I'm hoping I can just squeeze in some time and do that. I was in Iceland like four months back. So that trip also happened very impromptu. Um, but I think right now I just want to be in a more mellow and you know spiritual place. So I think I'm looking at Bali, going back to Bali again. Yes. So when you go on holiday, are you, are you actually working then? Is it like a proper job? That uh, no, no, no. I try to separate the two. So it depends. So when I went to Iceland, it was more of a recce that I was doing because we were adding that onto our portfolio. So I was not working, working, but yes, you know, like basically learning the laws of the land. But uh, on other trips, like for my last uh, trip that I went to, I was not working at all. I was just on my own because sometimes you just need to get away to come back to it all. Yes. Excellent. That's the end of the show. If you liked it, please leave a rating and review of the show. Just search for The Indian Startup Show on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Uh, if you're building something exciting, please send me an email, hello at neilpatel.co, or tweet at Indian Startup SH, or go to facebook.com forward slash Indian Startup Show. We'll connect. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>